welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting on Wednesday, February 5th. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Second. I, I pursue a general policies of Article 3-305 and 3-104 to move that the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County meet in closed session to discuss appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, <coughs> compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluations of appointees, employees, or officials whom this public body has a jurisdiction of to form administrative function to conduct matters relate to negotiations. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a section. second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for a vote on the motion to go into closed session. All those in favor, raise your hand say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We will see you at 6 o'clock. Thank you so much. Good evening. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting on Wednesday, February 5th in our your, um, year of 2020. I could say that, 2020. Uh, may we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and afterward we will stand for silence for first responders, military folks at home and abroad. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. <laughs> we have some housekeeping items to take care of. Uh, we have a, an agenda in front of us. Do I have a motion to accept the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions and comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the agenda as approved. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. I beg your indulgence. We have a lot of meeting minutes to approve tonight. Do I have a motion to accept the open and closed meetings from January 8th, the closed meetings from January 14th, the open and closed meetings from January 15th, and the open and closed from January 22nd, 2020? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions and comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion for all the dates that were listed above. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you all very much for your indulgence. We are now going into recognitions. Absolutely, board members, would you please join me up front? Good evening, everyone. So good to see all of you. You can say good evening. Good evening. <laughs> so good to see everyone. We are just delighted to uh, have our recognitions this evening. And we'll start, as usual, with our um, Energizer Bunny Award. So I'm going to ask if our sponsors would please come forward. Tonight's a pretty special night for our Energizer Bunny Award. I'm going to ask um, if Miss Huber would please, Kelly Huber, would please come forward. We're going to start with our special awards tonight. So come on up. Okay. And you introduce your folks. Thank you, Dr. Kane, and thank you for, for allowing us to be here tonight. Um, I am Kelly Huber. I'm the coach specialist with Character Counts, and I have brought with me some of my special people from the Character Counts Advisory. I have one of them standing right here. It's Wayne Humphreys, one of the co-chairs, and the other co-chair, Susan Coppich. Another very special person sitting right here in front of me is Chris Perkins, who has been with the advisory for so many years. She's a character counts coach, and she also was the first character counts coach coordinator, or coordinator. So when the initiative started 20 years ago, there was Chris. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, two other special people, familiar faces to all of you guys that um, I want to introduce from Centerville Elementary. We have Teresa Farnell. And Aaron Holthouse. Did she know? Did Aaron know? Oh, no. I know. Oh, no. Okay. And one last person that's here um, from the Department of Social Services, someone who supported Character Counts and has been a coach over at Centerville Elementary for a number of years, and that is Jody Simmons. So come join us. And I am going to turn the microphone over to Wayne so he can Thank add you. his two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to uh, recognize Carrie Ann Coppage this evening. Carrie 
here. Would you please come up? Carrie Ann, uh, <laughs> every time she makes the rounds. <laughs> um, those of you that have uh, come to our recognition dinners uh, know that I always start them with a uh, Tibetan saying, and it's Tashi Delay. And what that means is when people greet each other as they're walking and see one another, they say that, and it means I honor the greatness within you. And after talking to everyone and reading so many things about you, Carrie Ann, that certainly fits you. We do honor the greatness within you. But as I looked at the comments and heard the comments, a little light went on in my mind about a little light that I think you carry. You have a special light that goes and touches other people. It, in a very humble way, it allows them to see the greatness within themselves. And that is truly what I've seen and heard about you. And we are just so honored and blessed to have you. And we love you. And this is a little token <laughs> of our appreciation. <laughs> and we just thank you for all you've done for Character Counts over the years. The children you bring in. Whenever we need children, Carrie Ann comes with children. <laughs> So thank you so much for all that you have done for us. And it, it was just a pleasure to be here and recognize you. Thank, thank you. you. If, uh, I think you have some family members. Could you I call do. them? I do. I have my husband and my three children. Yeah, who I take everywhere. Why don't you come up here so we can have So congratulations again, Ms. Coppage, and thank you so much to our Character Counts family. That was a wonderful, wonderful surprise and recognition. Thank you so much. And as everyone is aware, our Energizer Bunny um, Award actually is, um, it's about dedicating or recognizing an employee, a person in the community who just keeps on going. And so that's why it's called uh, the Energizer Bunny Award. We have another Energizer Bunny Award, and this award is going to be uh, presented by Mr. Adam Tolley, who is our supervisor for a lot of things. Um, <laughs> history is one of them. He also supervises career technology education. So Mr. Tolley, won't you come forward? All right, so the first award is going to be recognizing Mr. Brian Stokes. Mr. Stokes, are you here? Please come on down. Congratulations. And let me just read a few wonderful things that have been said about Mr. Stokes. Mr. Stokes is the instructor for our CASE program. That's our curriculum for agricultural science education. And that is at Queen Anne's County High School. In addition to teaching this four course pathway, whom um, Mrs. Morissette and I will be visiting. We had to change our last visit because of a delayed school opening, but we're, we're ready to come over. Mr. Stokes is the advisor for the FFA, or Future Farmers of America program. Through FFA, students attend state and local conventions where they do community service, attend workshops, participate in business and industry tours, and attend college and career fairs. So we would just like to say thank you, thank you, thank you too much, uh, so much to Mr. Stokes. And before we let you go, Mr. Stokes, did you bring anyone with you tonight? Uh, my wife, Maddie. Okay, so Miss Maddie, come on down. <laughs> and have a picture with us. Please congratulate Mr. Stokes once again. Thank you. Thank you.
Our next award is the Spirit Award, and this award is awarded to Miss Lisa Booz. Miss Lisa Booz, come forward. All right. Ms. Booz is a valued member of the mathematics specialist team. She serves Kent Island Elementary School every day with a smile. <laughs> During December and part of January, though, Ms. Booz stepped up and she stood in the gap at Queen Anne's County High School. So how does one go from, high, from elementary school, primary grades to high school, you ask? She planned and implemented dynamic and engaging lessons for Algebra II and pre-calculus. She is multi-talented. <laughs> While a teacher was out on long-term absence, she willingly became the classroom teacher and supported many students in order to continue their highly rigorous coursework in those two subjects. Ms. Booz has also uh, supported the new math supervisor as she transitioned into the county, Ms. Uh, Smith. She developed the mathematics website that allows teachers a one-stop shopping experience to find their curricular documents, resources, and assessments for all grade levels. She supports every teacher she comes into contact with, with a smile, and is always happy to help. Queen Anne's County is truly blessed by her many talents, and we thank you, Ms. Booz, for all that you do every day for our school, for the school that you serve currently, and all the schools in the county. So thank you very, very much. Okay. I have family, the math specialist, my principal. So everybody that's here to support Ms. Booz, come on down. <laughs> Thank you. That's all stuff right there. Yeah, go on down. Hi. Oh, you're coming. 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 And our next recognitions are for the Shining Star Award. And these awards will, are also nominated by Mr. Tolly. So Mr. Tolly, I'm gonna ask that you come back down. <laughs> and we have very special recognition tonight for all of our CTE teachers. Absolutely. I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Tolly. Thank you, Dr. King. So uh, February is National CTE Month uh, nationwide. So we just thought it was fitting that we would uh, take this as the beginning of February and honor and recognize all of our CTE teachers for all that they do. I could not pick out a, a single one. They are all shining stars. I'm so thankful uh, that I have the teachers um, that I do. Anything I ask of them, they are you know, more than willing to do. The, you know, they are just here for our students. Um, and the, the services that they provide um, for our kids are just invaluable. So we are just really, um, really grateful for our teachers. Um, Queen Anne's County, the, the programs that we have here are you know, top in the state. So again, National CT Month, everything was fitting. We just really wanted to recognize them. So uh, we have just a, um, a few that were able to make it out tonight, but we want to recognize them. So all of the uh, CT teachers, if you guys would come up here, please. We'll squeeze in real tight and cozy. So we just have a, a just a certificate um, just to recognize everybody, those that are here. So uh, Miss Lauren B. Craft. 
Mr. Mike Blackiston. Mr. Glenn Brainer. Ms. Lisa Darby. Mr. Corey Dion. Mr. Ron Frederick. Ms. Marcy Mammis. Ms. Robin Paust. Ms. Kristen Herlock. And Mr. Brian Stoops. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you guys very much. Stay for a picture. Don't lose us yet. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> and that does it for our awards for this evening and our recognitions. Again, thank you to <coughs> Director Counts and for all of our CTE teachers and everyone who was recognized tonight. Thank you. You know, I, I'm not going to take this personally. Okay, so we are now at uh, board staff involvement. Board involvement, anyone like to contribute for the month of January? Captain Kelly? Sure. Um, I attended the uh, Chamber of Commerce breakfast, Ken Island Yacht Club. Dr. Kane gave a great talk at that. Um, went to the Bayside Elementary Blue Ribbon Blue Ribbon School event. It was it was very meaningful. I was there with with uh, Mr. Smith, and it was just a lot of fun. It's one of those great things to do. Um, also, May Legislative Committee. Just I know we're going to have a briefing tonight on the Kerwin Bill. It's very complicated. There are 300 pages to the bill. So I haven't really perused through the whole thing yet, but looks like I'll get a good preview from Mr. Fister tonight. Then. Um, the, and also, I went to the MABE uh, Board of Directors meeting, and we uh, one cool thing I learned about, which is for curriculum and instruction, it they not that we can do this. I mean, I'm just throwing out some great ideas. I've heard of two classes, Kent County, according to their one of their members. Um, has a class on financial literacy that they require their high school students to have. I love that idea because our kids have a lot of problems with finances. Um, so it's something to consider in the future. I know we have it as, as an elective personal mm -hmm. finance, but it'd be a great idea to have it you know, for the kids in the future. And, and the other one is um, Anne Arundel County has a new course they created called Global Community Citizenship. Mm -hmm. And you've heard about that one. It's it's a great um, course. They require that too of all their ninth graders. And basically, I, I thought it was like a civics course, 
but it's mostly deals with um, community citizenship with each other. And it, it starts, it talks about empathy for, for human beings, communication, collaboration, how to conquer biases, kind of fits a lot in with the equity issue or teaching people about cultural biases that we have. And it, and it, it really sounded interesting. There's a lot more than that. It talks about social issues of, an, of acceptance, talks about values. I mean, a lot of these things can be taught at home, but a lot of students don't get that kind of training at home. And they're finding that it, they're hopeful because it's a brand new course, that it will help with the relations that they have with each other and maybe prevent problems down the line, like in the bullying, you know, all that. So it's a ninth grade level course. So keep in mind, these courses are great to have. I wish we had more days in the, more hours in the day. Um, and the, so that's pretty much it. All right, Mr. Smith. Well, as in January, I've been on a couple of school visits. Um, one thing I'd like to know about, we're doing a budget, and we're spending a lot of time on then the staff and the board members up here. Um, it's a lot more complicated than most people know. Um, there's a lot of mandated things, contracts that we have to fulfill that are necessary to make this system work the way it does. And um, people need to understand <coughs> some of this stuff, and it would be helpful if more the public would have sustained some of this stuff. I don't think we've had anybody at our budget hearings in here. Um, and I understand why, but it's, it's, a, it's a lot of time and effort that goes into this. And um, it's, it's a complicated thing, and I just think the more people understand it, it, it would be better for everybody involved. Um, as with Captain Kelly said, it was attended Bayside Blue Ribbon and went with a chamber breakfast. Um, very impressed with that, because I think one of the main things our system can do is work with our business community because that's what we're doing. We're trying to put productive people back in society, not back in, educate our students to come into society and have opportunities. And I think it's over 60% of our community commutes <coughs> outside of our county. We're a bedroom community. And it's nice to see that we're working to create jobs. And we have some very interesting businesses in Queen Anne's County, if you look here. And I think we're working as due diligence to keep people hopefully close to Queen Anne's County. But. Thank you. Ms. Morissette? It was a slow month for me. Um, I only, I went to the annual Andy Schippel JV Wrestling Tournament. It was held on January the 18th at Queens County High School. It was good. Unfortunately, bad weather kept a good number of schools from joining in, but it was still a successful event. The only thing I have to add for uh, January is the elections are coming up in November uh, 2020 uh, for uh, well, the general election. and. Uh, districts three and four for the Board of Education are vacant. There, uh, no one came forth to put forth his or her candidacy for our two positions. If anyone has any questions or concerns about these positions, they have to, to I ask them to please um, contact the Board of Elections. They are the ones that will ha be handling it. It was not through the Board of Education. We've been fielding a lot of calls here, and I've been personally getting some phone calls and emails about it. That is all ran through the Board of Education and the Governor's Appropriations Office because we are still waiting for our fifth board member as, as we speak. So hopefully that will all be resolved then. So again, if anyone has any questions, please call the Board of Elections. Dr. Kane. Thank you. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about January, but mostly about February, because there are some upcoming events that I want to be sure everybody is aware of. Uh, so of course, in January, uh, as Captain Kelly mentioned, we had the, um, we sponsored the chamber breakfast with the Chamber of Commerce, and I gave my state of the schools. And um, it was well attended, had a lot of good questions, a lot of follow up emails, and um, just opportunities to collaborate and network was excellent. And we certainly do thank uh, Linda Friday and all the members there who um, invited us and, and were so kind to us. And we also had, of course, our Blue Ribbon School uh, tour and visit by the state superintendent. Of course, Captain Kelly and, and Mr. Smith were there. And um, it was very well attended with parents. The students were engaged, and they sang. And it was just an, a great opportunity. Uh, Mr. Baran, our county commissioner, was there. And just lots of support for that school and, and recognition of the hard work that the staff and the parents and, and of course, the leadership and the students 
uh, do. You know, just one of the things that they had to do to qualify for that recognition was that they had to be in the top 15 percent uh, in terms of performance on state assessments for English language arts and math and be closing achievement gaps and, and those kinds of things. So have engagement in the community and they did all of that and they just deserve all of the praise because they really did a great job. Um, Queen Anne's County has not had a blue ribbon school in over 20 years. So it was a, a long time coming and we're so happy that it happened for, for Bayside. Moving on to uh, February, of course, um, I had yesterday my student, my staff, and my parent advisory council meetings, and they were fabulous, always lots of input. Our students are going to um, be engaged in a mental health awareness um, project. One of the things that our students said that they wanted to engage in were either environmental um, efforts or mental health awareness. And so we did, you know, some posters yesterday to create an awareness for the youth art display competitions that's going to happen in May. So the week of May 3rd, uh, there will be um, a youth art contest, and it's sponsored by uh, Governor Hogan's wife, Yumi Hogan. And um, we are looking forward to our art teachers' support and all of the teachers and, and students. So our student council uh, moved forward with getting started on advertising for that. Our staff and our parent advisories, we talked a lot about the budget and we talked a lot about Kerwin. And so, uh, Mr. Smith, our families are watching. Uh, they may not be able to attend our budget workshops, uh, but they certainly are watching because we had a lot of conversation about things that were said, uh, have been said, and as we continue to work through that budget process. So they're watching. We also, I'll be attending, of course, my superintendent's meetings on Thursday and Friday of this week. We have Mr. Evans, who is, um, he's, he's representing Queen Anne's County Public Schools at the Census uh, Committee. So as you know, all of the agencies in the, in the county are working on that, and he represents us <coughs> on that committee. Um, we have on Friday, to, um, Friday night, the 7th, the African American Heritage Night at Sutlersville Middle School. We hope that everyone comes out at 6 o'clock for that. We also will have monitoring visits starting this week. So we've got um, this month, I should say, starting next week, we'll be at Sutlersville Middle, Graysonville, Church Hill, uh, Kennard, Arise, Centerville Middle this month, and it goes on and on. I will be at uh, attending the superintendent's conference in San Diego for uh, three days next week, and um, I'm looking forward to lots of professional development there. On this past Saturday, February 1st, we recognized some students who were award, awarded uh, scholarships. And one of the students that was recognized is our very own, Ms. Shannon Billups. Shannon and Christian Willits um, were the winners from Queen Anne's County. They won the J.C. Gibson Scholarship to help to cover costs for books and supplies <coughs> when they go to college. And we are just so very, very proud. That happened at the Black History Luncheon um, at Chesapeake College. I sit on the Multicultural Advisory um, Committee there, which is the group that sponsored that luncheon. So, and Ms. Bass accompanied me at that um, luncheon as well. It was great to see everybody there. So well done, Shannon. We also have coming up a legislative reception um, for uh, Mayo. That's the um, association, the Maryland Association for Outdoor Education. And they are looking for some of our teachers perhaps to join them um, on Wednesday, February 12th at about 5.30 in Annapolis. So we are, we're, we're soliciting teachers to participate there. Also this month, February 29th, the Kennard Alumni Association will present an afternoon celebrating African American history and heritage. That's going to happen at the Kennard African American Cultural Center, uh, Heritage Center, right across from our Kennard Elementary School. And that will happen at, uh, doors open at 1 o'clock. Admission is $10 for adults and $5 for students. Five and under are free. There will be light refreshments there. So anyone interested can contact the Alumni Association. We are on fire with our Black History Month activities in our schools. We had students that um, discussed a need to ramp it up, and our schools rose to the occasion. There are activities going on probably every day throughout the month of of February. So we are, yes, some students are, are reading with members of the community, but there will be some um, living history, uh, really um, 
I'll call it a museum, but they are performances, if you will, at some of our schools. Lots of different ways that our schools are going to be celebrating Black History Month and the accomplishments of various uh, people from uh, history a long, long time ago up to the current time. So we encourage all the community and the parents to go out to the schools, look on the websites, because I literally have a quarter inch thick document of all of the activities, different things happening across our district in different grade levels. And so uh, we'd be here until next week if I read them all. But uh, it's a good thing. We're doing great things in our schools. And I just want to shout out to all of our teachers and our administrators. Well done. Fantastic. Oh, and just uh, we have a legislative luncheon with Mabe next Thursday. Yeah, for yeah, Miller Med, yeah, a Miller Building. Um, hopefully, get some more feedback then as well. Um, next on our agenda, Mr. Kaluski. Thank you, Madam President. I'll just highlight a couple things uh, from the month of uh, January. On Wednesday, January 14th, Jan January 15th, excuse me, I had the great opportunity with Mr. Tolley to visit uh, Mattapique Middle School and the filming of Ask a Commissioner uh, with a group of eighth grade students. It was outstanding. Our students asked some great questions. They asked about the Bay Bridge. They asked about jobs for uh, young, young people in our district. And the commissioners really love the questions about school funding. So that was wonderful. On the 23rd, I had the opportunity with Dr. Kane uh, to participate at Stevensville on their History Day Expo, which was outstanding. The 28th, uh, accompanied the superintendent and Captain Kelly for our teacher um, reception to promote uh, folks to participate uh, in applying for the Teacher of the Year. And on um, January 28th, which is one of our staff development days, unfortunately one of my direct staff members had a death in the family and could not deliver PD. So uh, I stepped up and did that for Mr. Page. So I had the opportunity to deliver professional development uh, to about 180 elementary teachers, and it was great to spend some time with them, listening to some of their concerns. Um, so I appreciated that. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. A student board member reports. Ms. Shannon? Okay. Uh, we just started second semester, which is kind of crazy because it feels like it was the first day of school about yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I know we're very excited. We're gearing up for our own musical, and we're doing a You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. That's not until March, but I know kids are really excited <coughs> since we weren't allowed, We, not that we weren't allowed, we weren't able to do a play this year, so that's very exciting. And spring sports orientation is the 12th, which I can't believe Warner? Winter sports are over. I know we just had indoor track regionals on Monday, so that's pretty exciting. And then our spring open house is going to be the 19th, so excited for everyone to come and see what's going on in schools. We'll be hosting our solo and ensemble festival, which is awesome. I've seen a lot of kids have been rehearsing, so so excited to see the outcome. And I know our environmental classes are working on revamping up our it's a little back patio area outside of our cafeteria, and they're actually trying to build a bridge and a stream behind our school, so it's exciting to see students taking initiative to um, better our school. Great engineering program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So we've had an exciting start to our second semester as well, and even though it's the start of second semester, scheduling for next fall has already started. So on the 10th, the classes, every class will have their class meeting to talk about what will be offered next year. And then on the 14th, scheduling window closes and all these schedules will be solidified the rest of the year and sent out. Um, we're having our open house on February 19th at 6 p.m. And we'll be talking about the CTE pathway so students can go over to Queen Anne's. We have our spring sports orientation on February 20th, and it will begin at 6 p.m. And it's intended for new athletes and a lot of our upcoming freshmen. <coughs> National Science Honor Society will be hosting Trivia Night on February 28th, 6 to 8 p.m. in our cafeteria. It was a lot of fun last year, so we're excited to do it again. And then our spring musical is ramping up and getting ready. It's The Wizard of Oz. It will be the first two weekends of March. and Everyone's very excited to see all of the sets and our real life Toto that will be coming. <laughs> and also we'd like to congratulate our swim team who won Bayside's both girls and boys and our indoor track team that won at regionals this past week. So that was very exciting. Congratulations to them, that's awesome. 
And it's weird how they have your your open house on the same day. I uh, yeah. You know, it is. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, for me, I would like to go to both of mm -hmm. them and see how it's going. So I may have to spend some time and <laughs> split, <laughs> split your time. Split. Yeah. So, okay, and you have one. And just one last have. thing, it's important to announce. I got some phone calls over the weekend. Uh, just thanking us because we did one of the things that I said that I would make sure that we di I did while I was superintendent here is to um, offer an African American history course. So being that is African American History Month, I am just so pleased to announce that we have that course. It is being offered. It's in our program of studies. Uh, some community members called me over the weekend and they will be joining Mr. Tolly because part of that course is about sharing not only our history of, uh, of African American folk, but also the history of Maryland, African Americans in Maryland, and specifically in Queen Anne's County. So we have some community members who will be joining Mr. Tolley um, and, and the social studies teachers who are teaching that course to really build that curriculum to ensure that it really uh, encapsulates the experience of African Americans in Queen Anne's County. So big shout out to all. Fantastic. Anyone else? All right, we're at citizen participation. We ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster including their telephone number and address. Com comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to the matter of general policy, which this board has authority over. Comments about actions, statements, or individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment, and we should refer anything else to the superintendent of schools or the board president. If you have a specific question, and the board will make sure that appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but ask the courtesy of the, to this board and our citizens to show respect for all. And the first person we have is Richard McNeil. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Richard McNeil, representing myself in the retired personnel. Um, <laughs> Since it's CETE month, I'd like to uh, recognize the uh, Ron Frederick, who and the students who've been out there uh, in the shop as seniors. They are in the process of building a door from scratch for the old schoolhouse, the one room schoolhouse that's sitting out there. Uh, if you've gone by there, there's a patch on the bottom that's been there for about two years. Yeah. And um, through the help of uh, Nancy Cook on the, in the Historical Society, we've been able to get money to do this. Um, Ron was, uh, t with a little arm twisting, was well enough to take uh, his senior boys and take a, a door, or take wood, and build a door and showing them how to use the, the router bits and so forth to kind of shape it and put it all together. Um, I saw it in progress just before Christmas, and it was beautiful. It's made out of... Uh, um, poplar, two inches thick, and it's made just for that door. That door is much larger than a normal door. Right, Mr. Bender? That is correct, yeah. sir. And, uh, We've so seen it we, when we did our tour through the CT. Okay, well, we, if it you there, saw it, it's, it is beautiful. And Ron was mentioning to me that one of the things that he enjoyed about that was to be able to teach some of the boys how to use the router bits in order to shape it and how you have to put it together without gluing the inside piece because that's a, that's a piece that moves, you know, with the weather and so forth. So um, uh, hoping to get that finished up, and when we do, we want to have uh, the newspaper there to give credit to the, to the boys in the shop to do that. And, uh, but it is, they did a wonderful job, and it is heavy, but really right, heavy. Do you know if they're going to... Uh finish that off, put a urethane on it, or are they going to paint Actually, it? Actually, they're going to paint it. I asked him about that. Uh, if it's the, the type of wood it is is better painted than it is uh, okay. with a clear varnish. It's such or a beautiful piece of wood. I oh, was it like, is. Oh, yeah, well, I asked it's that It's a shame too. to have to paint it. Yeah, it'll be white. Sorry, so. question and answer. I'm sorry. Yeah, but that's that's good on that part. Uh, so thank you to him. And, and uh, having been principal out of the building out there, I know how hard uh, that whole group of uh, young men and ladies who do the teaching out there uh, work on that. Um, tonight from the art group also, I'd like to recognize all those who've been nominated for a Teacher of the Year. Uh, read through the list, it was exciting. Um, 
one of my pleasures uh, in the role of mentor that I'm doing this, you know, is going, being able to go from school to school in a lot of schools and seeing the quality teachers that we have. And uh, even our first and second year teachers that I work with are working very hard and learning the trade, if you will, and to be in that. So um, I know they're not all perfect, but the, the ones that I'm working with are doing a wonderful job. They're easily coached. Uh, they do listen. Um, we've shed a few tears and we've laughed and we cheered each other on, me more so to, to them. Um, also, uh, you know, when, when you go to a reception, the table looks nice, the flowers and the food is all set, but, you know, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to get to that. And uh, tonight I'd like to recognize and just kind of give a shout out to our teacher specialists and our academic deans. They work a part of the leadership team in the school, but they do an awful lot of work behind the scenes, especially for testing, which is we're coming up in our spring testing window. And in, in the many things that they do, they're also, most of them are in charge of getting all that paperwork together to make sure it's a successful program uh, and an ease for the testing for the students. And um, Again, just like to pat them all on the back and say, you know, continue to do the great job they're doing. So, Dr. Kane, you know, to them on that part. Absolutely. Um, we are we monitor the legislative issues. We, we the retirement group, uh, obviously, the legislation is well underway. Um, we're monitoring some some bills and so forth that might impact the, our pension. There's nothing serious yet, but you know, we do that the same way. And I, I thank Captain Kelly for keeping the board up to date on, on that kind of thing. Um, one of the other hats I wear in between is monitoring the wellness program that we have in the middle school for, through the University of uh, Colorado at Boulder. And I've been with uh, Christine Webster uh, a couple times in January uh, doing an outstanding job. Um, it's, I, I still applaud the program. You've heard me say that before. And I think it's, it's a, a program of decision making which is what we would like our teens to be able to uh, make some good decisions based on the information they have. Uh, I think she does a great job. Um, it's, it's almost like she needs a little bit more time to do it, but it, 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 the program is laid out very well. So looking forward to uh, kind of doing some things with that. Um, if you watched the uh, State of the Union last night, you heard our president uh, again mention money for career and tech programs in all high schools in the United States. Um, he said that three years ago, and I'm not sure any money came out of that, but you know, politics is what it is. Um, I would hope that the money would also go to schools who already have a career and technology program in place, uh, which is what we have here in the county. Uh, so we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, I'm glad the ladies mentioned the spring uh, musicals coming up. Uh, I've had opportunity to, to have conversation with the new director at um, Queen Anne's High School, uh, very enthusiastic, and uh, not that Ken Island isn't, but she's first year on the job here, but, and I think she's just uh, doing a great job. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but from what I see, she's just got the kids excited and, and ready to go on that part. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else like to have comment all right uh, next up we have the energy efficient pro efficiency project mr. Pender Good evening, President Harper, board members, Dr. Kane. My name is Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Welcome. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. <laughs> About 14 years ago, we implemented an energy conservation plan um, when Dr. Sadowski was superintendent. And um, we developed a, some regulations policy, had that implemented. And at the time, that is when the cost of um, energy uh, utilities was increasing at the time. Um, I was fortunate enough to take on that position at that time, and it's just something that um, I've held on to since I've been in the position of the COO right now. Um, 
The purpose of tonight's presentation is to explain the effectiveness of the Queen Anne's County Public Schools energy conservation policy and the cost saving measures associated with implementing the regulations. Just to give you a kind of an idea of what kind of money we're talking about here, um, a high school's utility bill, including propane, um, electric, heating oil, runs about $36,000 a month on, a, on average. Um, it can go up or down. I will tell you this, uh, during the months of January, February, and March, that's when you see your higher amount because you're using both electricity, heating oil, and propane. Um, the summer times, you can run around twenty-one, twenty-two thousand um, dollars a month in electricity. Um, however, with the installation of the solar panels, uh, you'll see that coming down with that cost. Um, middle schools are around eight thousand one hundred dollars a month, and then elementary schools are about seven thousand five hundred. So you're talking a significant amount of money that goes out each month that we're monitoring uh, on utilities. Can I interject real quick? Sure. Have we thought about um, why is one part of the building gas, one part of the building is oil? Have we tried to so, incorporate it to be so more cost effective with gas? High school, high schools, both high schools are propane. All right. Okay. Um, they have 18,000 gallon propane tanks out back. Okay. Um, our middle schools, um, they're either heating oil, propane, or we have three that are geothermal, which are our most energy efficient the, the, the newest ones, correct. So you'll see in my presentation how we're slowly getting away from heating oil and propane. Um, we're increasing our electric usage, but you'll see how with the uh, additions of several schools, we've kind of cut that down. Yeah, I didn't think that we had schools that had both. No, they don't have both. Okay, thank yep. you. Okay. Now, one question, now, two things I can see. High schools are a lot larger facilities mm -hmm. than elementary and middle, and I'm assuming they're used a lot more. Through you, yes. Because I, when I see the disparity of 36 to 8, you know. Well, you're talking square footage, too. So we got like 1.3 million square feet of schools. You're talking the size of Kent Island High School or Queen Anne's County High School <coughs> um, compared to, say, Centerville Elementary School. Right. Um, so, I mean, they're three times the size, yep. at least. So, I mean, that's that's typical of what you're seeing. Um, and the usage is, probably higher when you get into yes. high so, school being used at nighttime more. And, and we get through some of the strategies that we're using, yes. The um, elementary schools, we can put in setback mode around like four o'clock or so, depending if you have PFY or daycare, those kinds of programs. High schools, it's just a revolving city. I mean, we can shut down in setback mode certain sections, but you're always gonna have, you know, at least until seven, eight o'clock at night, the yeah, gym, sure. the uh, music wing, the auditorium for plays and all that. So, you know, it's monitoring all of that. And the the uh, we'll, cafeteria area is always, yep. especially we'll Ken Island. Yep. We'll go through that. And your auxiliary buildings. Yes. Outer buildings. Yeah. So just to give you an idea of the cost percentage of um, during the year or month, about 75, almost 76 percent um, goes to electricity. About 9 percent goes to uh, oil and propane is about 9.5 percent. And then our water sewer um, is 5.8. The only school that we have that is not on a public water system is Churchill Elementary School. That is still on a well. Um, however, they do have a, um, a sewer system that we feed into. So we do pay that portion of the bill for that. Now, correct me. Sure. I thought because they don't have town water. They don't that's have a why. town water. Yep, that's correct. Um, so with the program that we have, I like to compare apples to apples. Um, when you look at cost avoidance, everything that we compare um, goes back to our base year, which is 2004, 2005. So from May of 2004 to April of 2005, we tracked how, much, how many kilowatts we were using, the amount of money we spent on electricity. We tracked the heating uh, oil in gallons. We also tracked the propane water sewer. We put all that into our computer system, um, and then you also have to put in there how many heating degree days or cooling degree days you have. So when you see the presentation tonight, you're going to see HDD, so that's heating degree days. Anytime the temperature is under 55 degrees, you add one degree below that. So if it's 54, you add one. If it's 53, you add two. And that's how you can track how cold it was that winter 
or if it's above 55 degrees, that's when you track your cooling degree days when you need cooling to, um, for, for the buildings. Believe it or not, as in yesterday, Queen Anne's County High School, I don't know if you were on the second floor, um, but it's 65 degrees out, you know, uh, in February. Who ever thought the chiller needed to be running um, in the middle of January? So that's something where some of the buildings like geothermal, we can run heating and air conditioning at the same time. Some of the schools are just two pipe systems and you can't do that. You have to have several days. Um, so there is a pretty complex ratio, but going back to the cost avoidance, what we do, like I said, is compared to the base year. We've been doing this program for 14 years now. So everything is compared to that base year. So they're saying in the computer formula, hey, had you have kept on doing what you were doing, this is what you would have spent. You've, so your cost avoidance um, for this past year is um, around $790,000, all right? And this will kind of tie in together when we go to the next couple slides. But with that being said, our overall reduction for 14 years is about 30% of our utilities. And I'll show you some kind of impressive numbers here in a few minutes that kind of compare this to apples to apples. Um, as you can see in our first year, we kind of started out slow as you would imagine. Um, we kept building and building up and you're gonna go, hey, what happened in that 10th year? All right, you saved a, a little over a million dollars of cost avoidance. If you remember, that was the polar vortex. All right, and we actually, when you put the uh, information in there, you, it can actually go in the wrong way if you're not really maintaining your facilities and watching them because the polar vortex, that was when you were just using energy left and right, but we were still able to maintain that uh, winter, um, a pretty good cost avoidance there. So over the uh, 14 years, we got almost a $9.9 .9 million cost avoidance. All right, now, I was talking about the base year. In our base year, we used 14.7 million kilowatt hours, 154,000 gallons of heating oil, 248,000 gallons of propane. Um, in 2004, we spent $1.64 uh, million. If we were to have used that same amount this year with the current prices, uh, we would be paying uh, $3 million, all right? So we have cut out a significant amount of um, utilities. Again, that's money that could be funded somewhere else to fix something else in the school, it could be funded to, you know, supplies, things like that, instead of spent on utilities. Um, the reduction of kilowatt hours. This is where we're getting to kind of the apples to apples. I wanted to kind of point out a few things here. Um, in the base year, as I said, we had 14.7 million kilowatt hours. This past year, we had 12.9 um, million. So we've cut that down um, about 1.9 million. But a couple of key facts here. In 2007, which is the third year, and then also um, in 2012, which is the eighth year, and in 2016, which is the 12th year, we added Mattapique Middle School, we added Sellersville Middle School, and we added Stevensville Middle School. All three of those schools are geothermal, so there is no um, propane, there's no heating oil, but as you can see, we've maintained the reduction in kilowatt hours. Um, if we weren't doing what we were doing, I could definitely see us um, down to maybe a million only saving that. So we've added those buildings, they're geothermal, strictly electric. Um, we've been able to cut out 20, uh, 27 million kilowatt hours. Well, remember, uh, and I, I think this was 2013, 14, we had a lot of complaints about all the lights being on all the time at Mattapique Elementary School, so mm -hmm. that got put on a timer, yep. that, so that got set back all the schools now. Right. So, yeah. so that's cutting back the kilowatt hours. Yep. And we'll go through that at the end, uh, okay. the different strategies. But um, that's, that's just plating, you yep. playing into you're right. what it's, you're Yes, about. I mean, you'll see how much the uh, funding is for every 15 minutes the systems are running, and you'll see uh, with the reduction in outside lighting what we've done. Um, reduction in heating oil. What we try to do here, um, you'll see it kind of goes up and down. Um, as you can guess, uh, in the seventh year, we um, 
we had a pretty um, mild year. That, I'm sorry, uh, that was the polar vortex, I'm sorry. We saved quite a bit that year um, with the polar vortex going on. You'll look at other years, like this year had 2,476 um, heating degree days. I try to find years that are similar to that because then you're really comparing your buildings. It's not just, hey, we did a great job this year. Well, yeah, you did do a great job, but you only, it was a very warm winter. You should have done a great job. So when you're looking at this, like I said, it's really comparing apples to apples. Um, year 13 and year 11, we're running about uh, 2,000 uh, heating degree days. So you're seeing that reduction of about 70,000 um, gallons in heating oil. But I also want to point out, in the 12th year, that's when we took Stevensville Middle School offline. All right, so there's no heating oil being used there, but we're still having an increase in reduction of what we're doing. Um, again, some presentations you'll see where they'll take credit for it, but you really got to look at apples to apples here. Um, just real quick, reduction of propane. Um, Propane, as you know, is, is a large consumer. Uh, we had 154,000 gallons in our base year. This past year, we used uh, a little over 71,000 gallons. Um, with propane, when you start getting into polar vortexes and things like that, you're going to go through some propane. I mean, it's heating oil, you get that higher burn rate. Um, looking back again, if you want to look at the 14th um, year and the 11th year, you're kind of comparing the same temperatures outside. Um, looking um, at year number seven, yeah, we, we did awesome that year. But again, you only had 1,700 heating degree days. So, you know, you take that with you know, a grain of salt um, when you're going through there. One of the areas, yes, ma'am. A question on propane, um, I know as a homeowner, I mean, you can get all kinds of prices on it. And yes. you, do you, do you change your contract e each year? Because you can, each, each year, each year it's, it can yeah, get we, cheaper. We have a really good price on there. Um, okay. We shop the market and look at the forecast and kind of when the stars align and the price goes to a certain point, it's that's when you want to grab grab it. Because okay. uh, if you don't, you never know with the, the Middle East and other areas, a refinery could catch on fire and then that price is going to skyrocket. Well, so we they, don't pick it back on the county? You we, no, the amount of, of heating oil that we use is okay. far higher than. Well, one time up in New Jersey, the caverns froze up mm -hmm. about a few years few years back, and we had to go way down to New Orleans yep. and uh, truck it up. That's when they had that polar vortex. Yeah, yep. and uh, they we couldn't even get the propane out of those uh, yep. caves, and it was a problem. You're right. So yeah, we do look at that, um, and when the market we feel that's right, we we buy it, purchase it then. Um, summer reduction. This is a, a pretty interesting one here. Again, now you're looking at cooling degree days. But what we do in the summertime, we team clean the custodians. We kind of set back one school, they go to another school, so we close down two or three schools. Um, we're not running at full throttle at the schools they're not at. Um, I will say this, it's a constant juggle. Um, each month, the uh, administrative secretaries turn in a calendar to Jolene, um, one of the ladies in my office, and she puts together an HVAC calendar. So if the items are listed on there, it's going to be running. If it's not on there, it's going to be in setback mode. But summertime, you have um, summer school. You have special programs going on um, for uh, different students. You have um, PFY, I'm sorry, daycare going on at one of our Agreed. schools. It is professional development. It's constantly, um, you know, things occurring. Last summer we had something new. Um, we moved uh, the um, uh, summer school from Sellersville Elementary to Churchill Elementary so we could paint Sellersville Elementary School. Well, you can't have the building, you know, high humidity, so we're still running Sellersville Middle School. But as you can see, we were still able to uh, cut back on the um, summertime reduction. So I want to just give a shout out to Jim O'Donnell and Jolene Gottlieb, I mean, because they spend hours and hours making sure that the items are in there. So in the summertime, in 14 years, we've cut out about 11.3 million uh, kilowatt hours. 
Um, our percentage of savings, like I said earlier, it's about uh, a little over 30% over 14 uh, years. Factors to our success, as some of you were just mentioning, um, we don't turn the air conditioning, the heat off. It goes into setback mode. So in the wintertime, if there's nothing going on in the school at 4 o'clock, it goes back into 60 degree. Um, we can recover that in the morning. The geothermal schools, you got to watch a little bit closer because it's harder to come back after that. What we used to do, we, um, we would have summer school and different after school activities. Say Mrs. Jones wanted to have in her classroom. So we would run one whole wing and then Mrs. Rogers would want her classroom we'd run another whole wing. Now what we do is we centralize all of the activities so that we're just running one wing um, and we're not running the whole entire school for summer school. Churchill does a great job with it, um, Sellersville Elementary, and that, that comes down to the administrators. Um, the consolidation of summer school, after school activities, like I said, with the custodians, um, team cleaning, the facility audits going into buildings at nighttime, weekends to see, hey, the system's telling us it's off. Is it actually off? Uh, monthly calendars I mentioned earlier with the HVAC. Um, basically, out of the 14 buildings we have, I can control or take a look at 13 of them on my laptop. Thank you. It used to be somebody would call and I'd have to leave home and come into the office. But now um, we're able to do 13 out of the 14 and hopefully in another year we'll be able to do all 14, which is also beneficial because a lot of times we can fix something on the computer instead of sending a technician out there. Um, summer four-day work week has helped out a lot and then also team cleaning has helped out with us um, some interesting facts if we turn up the lights in all of our buildings for one hour a day that's about thirty seven thousand um, dollars all those what we call phantom uh, standby load load that's where the computers just plugged in all summer and nothing's occurring that's eighteen thousand um, dollars here's the major one for every 15 minutes that our HVAC system is run in all the schools, all right, for every 15 minutes a year, that's about $26,000. So as you can see, one hour, you're up to a hundred and some thousand dollars. Um, so that right there is a significant savings. Um, vending misers on the soda machines save us about 12,000. Um, we have installed, um, when we did our Johnson Controls performance contract, um, our computers are basically on 24-7, which was costing us about $649,000. What's a vending miser? It just controls the, um, the, uh, the chilling mechanisms on the um, soda machine, so it's not just running 24-7. So it's monitoring the temperature and it brings it on when it needs, kind of like your air conditioning at home, your thermostat. Mm -hmm. You shut those down in the summer, though, right? I mean, nobody needs When we're not using ones, yes. And we also consolidate our um, walk-in freezers, refrigerators in the summertime um, where we're storing food. Um, for every penny, the electric rate goes up at Ken Island High School. That's $2,000. So as you can see, that can add up quite a bit. A middle school like Centerville, that's about 800 You were talking, Ms. Harper, about the outside lights. Basically, our lights are on timer system in the evening for our exterior, and we save about $38,000 doing that. Have we asked the administrators of the buildings to ask the teachers and staff to unplug stuff at night? Like, I, I know some teachers have personal printers, or they have their, you know, their cell phone chargers, or whatever they have plugged into their rooms. Have we asked them to turn them off or unplug them at night? Basically, to help with this? Just in the summertime, basically. Okay. I mean, the winter, I'm I know, school I know it's pennies. No. I know it's pennies, but if you talk about 14 buildings and X number of classrooms in each building, I mean, that could be a, that could be substantial down the road. We could take a look at that. Yeah. It's somebody's salary. Yep. Well, that's what I'm saying. This is all money we could be putting towards something else instead of spending I agree. I'm utilities. just, I'm just, I know yep. it's nitpicking. I'm just mm -hmm. asking if we have sure. an, addressed it. Mm -hmm. Talk about phantom, yeah. yep. phantom lights. When you, uh, we instituted the EMS controls, I remember when we approved that contract. And mm -hmm. you, have you seen the considerable, I know it's a factor of success, was it considerable, did it match what they predicted? Um, You're talking about, about the Johnson controls? Right, Johnson yes. controls. We actually were discussing that today um, mm -hmm. and looking over. So we had five years of data afterwards and it did exceed what we had expected. It, okay, um, I will say with the, the performance contract, 
you're, you're looking at dollar for dollar. I mean, it's like, hey, we're projecting you will save this based upon how much this costs to run. So it's a pretty <coughs> thorough analysis. And yes, it did right. we're, where we're supposed to be with that. And what about Solar City? Has that say yep. any cost effect? We don't have, we'll be finishing up this. Year number five, right? No. Well, for the, the major one at um, Queen S. Kenny High School. Because we put that in when I was here the first time, so. That was Graysonville. Okay. Graysonville Elementary. Yes, we have. But I thought um, it was at Centerville Middle, that the solar pan, the solar field we had at. We have a solar field at Centerville Middle School that feeds Centerville Middle School, Queen Anne's County Queen High, High School, School, and then we're also able to um, feed uh, Ken Island High School with that. The, the good thing about Centerville Middle School, it's the first school in the state that has a battery storage system, so mm -hmm. we're actually able to store energy there um, and use it right. when you know the downtime comes or it's cloudy. Um, we were able to get that through a, a grant from uh, the Maryland Energy Administration. Nice. Um, so we have seen that cost go down. Um, I will say with ESMEC, where we purchase our electricity, um, we were able to secure uh, a cheaper rate coming up for kilowatt uh, for supply. It, it does see where the, the demand rate, say from Delmarva Power Chop Tank, has gone up a little bit, but the supply rate itself has is, is gone down. So I, I think we're in pretty good shape. Who does ESMAC have us with? Uh, Washington Gas and Electric. Okay. So yeah, that's who I have. We hedge out yeah. in advance and buy certain amounts. And they then, were the most competitive this last year. And then we've actually, on the open market, we've been fairly successful with that, you know, waiting to buy at a certain time for the current market. So, yes, ma'am. Um, we do prepaid pre propane also. Do you? Have you ever investigated that? Because yeah, we, we get a great deal on that. We know. lock in, the amount of volume that we use, we lock in okay. at, a, at a really good rate. Who's our current propane provider? Sharp Energy. Yep. Out of Easton, which... That's love us. Well, I can tell you when one tractor trailer pulls into Queen's High School, that's 9,000 gallons on that tractor trailer. So, um, but I will say Sharp Energy is very res responsive to our needs. Um, with vaporizers and things like that if they go out. Tri gas uh, heating and oil does our heating oil. Okay. So we've been pretty lucky with both of those. All right. Any other Thank you. questions or comments? I think an interesting report and it's, it's it shows both sides of it, not just saving it, but you're taking into consideration where it would be you know, we're getting bigger and we're doing this and stuff. And, it, and that's stuff it, you it, got it, it, it's, yeah. a, it's a good report to sink into and see what we're, you know, we're, if we weren't doing this, it'd be out of control. Mm -hmm. The only thing in jest I could tell you is maybe we can put you on the health care system next year. <laughs> <laughs> and see if you can do some health safe I'll savings. Stay. I'll stay with this. <laughs> thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. The superintendent monitoring visits, number one, Dr. Kane and Mr. Paluski. Sorry, Sid, I'm throwing you out. That's all right. Good afternoon or good evening for the record. Andrea Kane, superintendent, and my sidekick. <laughs> Deputy Superintendent Greg Poliski. But it's not just. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, board members. Uh, the purpose of uh, our presentation this evening is threefold. Number one, we want to go over an overview with you uh, about the superintendent monitoring visits that we conduct, really what that looks like, the cycle. Uh, the second to share is a summary of the results uh, from our fall monitoring visit. And the third is to share the, really the progress of our schools as it relates to their instructional goals, specifically as it relates to gaps in student performance. There are three major components to why we do monitoring visits and the time that we spend in schools. Um, the first is that is to offer feedback, um, specifically through the data-wise improvement process, and we'll talk about that initiative now that we've been implementing for three years. Um, the second part, which is one of our favorite parts, is the visit classrooms. We spend about an hour and a half um, in classrooms while we're at visiting school sites to collect information, specifically what the school's focused on, coach, give feedback, uh, look at uh, what we're seeing students engaged in. And the third is really engaging with not only the principal, but the principal's leadership team.
team, how they're using data, how they're using their resources, what they're seeing about students learning, students that aren't learning, what are they doing about it, how are they making changes uh, through the, throughout the school year. And the next thing we'll share with you is the structure of our monitoring visits. So we do our on-site visits, and, and we go to schools for different reasons, and, and we've had you doing walkthroughs, and, and we've been accompanying you for that. These monitoring visits are specifically to look at academics, we look at discipline, we look at student performance and educator performance. We look at the work that the leadership team is doing in terms of how they're moving forward with their data-wise improvement, as Mr. P mentioned. So there are a lot of different things that we focus on and the schools are aware of all of them, so they have an opportunity to really get prepared and get their reports prepared. Uh, my team consists of myself, Mr. P, as the deputy. Uh, we have the uh, program director for teacher and leadership development, Mrs. Pauls, is part of that, as well as our curriculum and instruction supervisors, who are required to do at least two of those visits. And it really doesn't matter which one um, they attend or which two they attend. They they are instructional, and so their, their feedback is, is significant and, in all of them. Uh, our principal um, team consists of, or the work that they prepare for us is about their data review. So we're looking at achievement data for students, not only our state assessments, but we look at, remember last year we purchased the STAR 360, which is a, a screener, so we look at data from that. We look at data from benchmark assessments, all types of data we look at to help determine uh, where we are in terms of student progress. We look at attendance data, we look at class classroom walkthrough tools so that we can really focus our visits. Sometimes principals want us to look at outcomes particularly so that we can offer feedback for that. Sometimes the principal will say, well, we're going to look at um, one of the goals on my SLO, which might be math or English, and look at how particular groups of students are performing. So tools are designed to help support those things as well. And of course, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we look at the data-wise improvement process. I see you have on here the school improvement plan. Absolutely. So every single, yeah, because I've been on three school improvement teams, so I, I know the process and the, the, the time and effort that it takes to put into that. I mean, I'm only there a small time. So um, as far as the school improvement plans, they have their, their goals that they're set for. So how are you seeing our, are you going to be noticing, telling us that, how they're? Yeah, we're going to talk that? about our strengths, and then we're going to talk about our challenges as well. But yes, that school improvement plan really talks about the, um, the goals that each school has in terms of academics. And sometimes it's behavioral. Sometimes it's attendance. It just depends on where they need to focus. The, the way you describe this, though, it, the, the principal can kind of set the agenda based on some guidelines, is that how that works? Yes, so the three things that we just talked about, that's part of the data that they collect. I'm gonna, we might as well flip to the next page because I'm gonna share with you all of the different parts, the components of, okay. of, that, um, of that visit. So I'll just share with you, I'm gonna get to your point, but I just wanna share with you, I share with you what my leadership team is comprised of for my visit, but for each school, of course the principal is there, the school counselor is sometimes a part of that um, team. If there's an assistant principal, you know we don't have assistant principals at the elementary level, but we do at the secondary level. Uh, teacher specialist, math specialist, reading specialist at the high school level, academic dean. So any combination of those, um, of those employees are part of that team, that leadership team. Of course, the, um, the principal and the school leadership team, they give us that data, and that data includes, as I mentioned before, it could be student performance data, educator uh, performance, and when I say educator performance, I'm talking about uh, feedback from their observations um, is generally what we're looking at. Um, attendance, staffing, budget, professional development, plans that the school has. So the components, what teacher, what principals and the leadership team have to gather for us is the school improvement plan. Part of the data review includes assessment inventory, discipline, student performance, intervention data. All those things are included in their data review. Uh, and again, I mentioned the classroom walkthrough tools, the data-wise improvement process, which involves us looking at problems of practice, which means that we have identified learner-centered problems, so problems that students have translate to focus for teachers. So if I'm having a problem with my students in math, I'm going to be looking at how my teachers are teaching math. And then provide intervention. Absolutely. 
but, but you've given them kind of this is what you need to see and they have they, a they've got this some is priority. This is, they, yep, this is the structure for all of them. It can be different based on the principal's priority, right? I mean, they, they have to provide all this, but the way they what they emphasize may be different. They have an opportunity to add more stuff if they want. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So part of the assessment inventory and the data that we look at in terms of student performance is going to drive their focus. But these are the requirements, and it could be a focus, like I said, on math. Could be a focus on English language arts. Okay. Depends so on what the data shows. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and I won't click on that hyperlink, but the hyperlink there, I think, gets to some of the questions you had, Captain Kelly. This is our school improvement site. Uh, we've had this now for five years, and uh, if you click into that on the left-hand side, you'll see all the requirements that schools have to turn in as it relates to the ESSA plan that we have to turn into the state. What you'll also see is clear alignment to our two or five areas of our strategic plan. So if you drill down into that, you'll see the whole, you'll see a summary of the school improvement plan, but you'll also see a very detailed level of that school improvement plan. You'll also see their professional development plans that are also here. You'll see um, how often they're having school improvement team meetings. Uh, we track that as well. And all the way down at the bottom on the left-hand side, which is section D of our site, gets to the superintendent monitoring visit. So there, you can actually see all the presentations that our schools do. You can see the evidence of what they're focused on. Um, there's also tools that are there, templates for them to use. And there's also a series of questions that we've pre-given them that these would be some of the types of questions that you would anticipate us asking um, while we're engaged in this dialogue about your data and how students are doing. So it's just broken down into those kind of subsections, uh, but all that information is there and it's certainly accessible to you for you to take a look I at. Just, I, I tried to get on and I couldn't get on the I just site. tried just now to. Yeah, it's, denied so access. it's not? Okay. Uh, Denied access. Okay. okay. We'll get you access. Yep. We'll okay. get you access. That'd be great. Sure. It sounds like a lot of information. So yes. Is, it's, it's, read. All of our schools, all of our 14 schools plus uh, Rise Academy, uh, our alternative center. So it's, it's completely transparent. You'll have everything that's there for all of our, sh all of our schools, which are doing a tremendous job. Uh, you know, they have to do, they have to put a school improvement plan together. It's got to be tied with a district plan. Uh, but there's just a tremendous amount of work that our leaders are doing. Um, and, and some good things, which are getting ready to share with you. So how do the SLOs tie into that? I mean, do you you send over your SSLs to them and then they have to provide the data for that? Is that how that So works? what we do is... Uh, Student learning objectives. Yes. For those people who don't know. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But what we do is we look at... They set their own goal. They look at their data and it's a variety of data as I mentioned before and they start to determine what they need to focus on. So if I'm in a school, I'll give you an example, I won't say the name of the administrator, but this administrator has some concerns about African American math scores. And so one of that administrator's SLOs or objectives, goals, is to reduce the number of failures, right, in that course. So he sets a goal, he generically sets a goal for that, and, um, and we monitor that goal throughout the course of the school year. That's a good opportunity along with these um, superintendent monitoring visits to have some good face-to-face -face time with our administrators and the leadership team and really to dig through our data, our student performance data and all of the other pieces that we include in there and have some conversations rather than just simply a reporting out. Helpful, helpful dialogue. Mm -hmm. Right. So they Sorry. come up with their SLOs on their own? They do. But they, do they have any guidance from you as to how they... So they the only guidance really that they, ha they get from me is that they need to focus at least one of those SLOs on a gap group, a student group that is not uh, meeting the same or similar performance levels as the general group. We talked about that in September mm -hmm. when you put forth your... The superintendent goals. We talked about that then. Absolutely. So um, my team and um, you know bases their goals off of my goals. School principals base their goals off of their school improvement goals, and then they also target, like I mentioned before, a gap group. So uh, we just like to share, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time because we've generally spoken about some of these accomplishments. Of course, we always want to give kudos to our exceptional school leaders and our staff in the schools, as well as our support staff that really just work together and, and create a warm and welcoming environment that many of you have experienced and on your school visits uh, already.
And we also want to just say one more time how proud we are of our Blue Ribbon School. And uh, we are, we're looking forward to possibly celebrating them as a, uh, a, um, a national Blue Ribbon School. So we shall see. Our youth apprenticeship program, as you know, Mr. Tolley is leading that program up and he is doing a great job getting out in the community and, and placing our students. The photo that you're looking at right now is Y River Marina and we have uh, two youth apprentices at that location. We have um, five students placed all together and we will certainly be increasing that number of students as we move forward. Of course, as you know, that's one of my goals. So we are working diligently on that. And a shout out to Rob Marsh. For Absolutely. River for helping put out. I mean, he was a driving force behind that, and thank God for him. Yep, exactly. Okay. And Adam Tolley, I'm not going to take that away from Adam. <laughs> oh, he's, he's definitely. Kudos to him. Yes, and our students, they're doing a great <laughs> job. And you have had a presentation on the Maryland report cards already. We just like to give kudos to all of our schools. As you know, we have two schools that are five-star schools, nine schools that are four-star, and we have one school that um, is a three-star, but missed that fourth star by less than 0.2%. Um, <laughs> and so, Mr. Peel, talk about some of the strengths. Sure, we'll talk about uh, just some of the strengths, and I'll, I'll touch base on, you know, kind of highlighting these. But one, in, and I think uh, the board members uh, picked this up very quickly on your visits, our schools are very welcoming. Uh, as soon as you hit the school, you can just feel that this is a place of teaching and learning. That's obvious. Uh, when we do our visits, we feel the exact same way. Uh, as you know as well, and, and through uh, a lot of different dialogue, our schools are engaged in their communities. You know, at any one night, there are multiple things that are going on in any one of our schools from elementary to high school. Um, there's an overall sense of not only all of our school leaders and our principals, uh, teachers, and our central office staff to have a commitment to improving outcomes for students. That is such a positive thing. I mean, everybody knows why they're here, what they're focused on, and that's a very positive, um, uh, that's positive. It's extremely positive. Our schools have a tremendous amount of data. Uh, we spend a lot of time not only sharing data with them from a central office, but when we do our visits, uh, whether it's at the teacher level, the, the principal level, there's a variety of data points that they're looking at at any one time, and they're focused on where things are working and where things are not. That's a tremendous, uh, tremendous success. Our classroom teachers, we focused over the last couple years, and they've had some new direction on uh, classroom objectives or outcomes. Um, and we've done some professional development with them. We're going to continue to do some professional development. And that really is the foundation. And I know that the superintendent and myself, when, when we've walked with you, that's one of the key things that we point out when we're going into classrooms because that really sets the focus of the instructional uh, expectation for that particular day. So we're seeing some, some improvement in that area. As we mentioned, we're in the third year of the data-wise improvement process. Uh, schools, they really range uh, differently depending on um, specifically if they've had a new leader come into their building, they may go back to the beginning of that cycle. And the data-wise improvement process is purely about how to look at your data, how to really determine, as Dr. Kane said, narrowing your focus on, t on uh, student behavior to reflect back on teacher behavior that's going to impact that. Um, so we're making some great progress in that area as well. Uh, as you know, our curriculum supervisors come and, and they'll present to you, and you know they wear many hats. Um, they do a lot of work supporting schools, whether that's from the curriculum documents that they put together. Uh, they're actually doing on-site monitoring visits to providing a, 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 certainly one, at the request of the principal, or two, they'll go out and monitor that themselves to see if the professional development that they've delivered is actually being implemented. I know that our principals value the feedback that they get from our supervisors. There's a lot of professional development that happens. As I just mentioned, we just had two days at the elementary and uh, the middle school level. There's a lot of professional development that happens at the ground level. And a lot of that is tribute, contributed to our teacher specialists, our math specialists, our reading specialists, our academic deans that are ongoing basis monthly providing professional development. The use of technology across our district, I think, sometimes absolutely amazes us what, what students are doing appropriately as well as teachers are doing to engage students. Um, so that is a, a huge strength. Um, manipulatives, the resources that our schools are using, you know, not only using the data, monitoring the data, 
Um, I think collectively, we've also seen in our first visit a decrease uh, in discipline referrals from where we were last year. I think that's a very positive thing as it relates to that. The superintendent mentioned the administrator SLOs tied to the teacher SLOs. Um, our reading interventions uh, have had a significant streamline um, in alignment uh, from elementary to high school. We're seeing some, some significant gains. In fact, I believe in March we're going to bring to you a gains report on those uh, interventions so you can actually see the progress that we're making. Uh, and our work that our schools are doing around equity and ensuring that all students are being engaged in the academic process are all tremendous strengths. And I'll share with you some of the challenges that we still uh, continue to work on. So, and, and recall, these are this is a summary of feedback that has been given to schools, our assessment of where we need to go as a district. Schools have different concerns uh, depending upon what their student population is and, and academic performance and, and that kind of thing. But in general, we're looking at some challenges around um, uh, achievement gaps. So we continue to experience achievement gaps. You have gotten some reports already this year. Our goal one report talks about our progress toward our learning outcomes. So our same groups, uh, students who receive special education services, African-American students, students who uh, are receiving free or redu reduced cost meals, and also our English learner students continue to lag behind the aggregate group. And we continue to work on strategies to improve their performance. Uh, implementation of those equitable practices in leadership and in instruction. Our data-wise process does a lot um, to support that work when we look at practices for leaders as well as for instructors. Um, we, we are still trying to wrap our heads around, uh, you know, and, and really um, apply the mindset that sometimes a school or student group needs more than others, and sometimes a school or a student group will need less than others. And we still continue to work on the mindset that less or more is equity. Uh, so we continue to work on that. It's not unfair. It does require a shift in mindset, and we continue to work on that. There are disparities and inconsistencies um, between schools uh, as it pertains to staffing. You already know that. Sometimes services are offered uh, to students that are not the same in schools. We've had conversation about that. And sometimes that's the result of the varying student populations or the uh, funding that schools receive. At the end of this school year, the Maryland Report Card is going to um, display, a, um, as an ESSA requirement, a financial page. So all of our schools will have some uh, financial data attributed to it so that we can look at the cost per pupil, uh, allocation per pupil. Sometimes it's going to be higher uh, if that school has received some additional funding. Most of the time, of course, that will be through federal funds, and sometimes it'll be lower. If there are significant numbers of students at any particular school that receive any of those services that you see there, that's going to bring additional income to that school. So there will be some fluctuations between schools with regard to the cost or the allocation per pupil. And that's going to be out for, for everybody at the end of the school year. Um, the state is working on that. Um, the level of daily rigorous instruction and that alignment between curriculum standards, the instructional practices, and the assessments can be inconsistent from times between schools. So we really are focusing, and you're going to hear me talk about rigorous instruction again and again. Our students pretty much, are, in the aggregate, do well. Uh, we see opportunities there for our teachers to really bump up the rigor in some courses and um, ensure that they are teaching to the level of of rigor that's identified in the teaching standard, the content standard that they're teaching to. So we continue to work on that. And of course, we want to be sure that we are continuing to offer that targeted professional development that really is centered on giving meaningful feedback to our teachers. And as a leadership team, we work on that for our principals. So we want to be sure that we're giving feedback. If there is an area that needs to uh, have a focus, then we want to give the feedback that's going to allow a person to apply the right strategies, understand what it takes for improvement, whether it's for the educator's improvement or the student's improvement. Dr. Kane, I want to just ask a question. 
How do you increase the level of daily rigorous instruction? How, I mean, how? So that's one of the things that our our supervisors help with. Okay. So. Some of, the con some of the standards that Maryland has for instruction are very dense. They might have five, six, seven things in it that teachers need to teach, that students need to know, be able to do, understand. And a lot of times that requires us to unpack that, or we call it sometimes to deconstruct that standard part by part by part so that we are not watering down anything, but so that over a period of time the students can master each part of that standard. And that is a practice that is ongoing, um, not only across you know, our county, but really across the state, because Maryland has some very hefty um, standards. And that's part of the reason why we focus so much on the outcomes and understand that teachers and administrators understand the difference between what a standard is asking them to do, how they're going to teach it, and why they need to teach it. Why do students need to learn it? So those are the three pieces of objectives that we try to focus so much on. And a lot of our teachers have got it. They, you know, it's not an issue, but there are several teachers who do not, and we continue to focus on that. And that is important because the standards are what drive our state assessments. Do you so think we it's more important at the elementary school level? I think it's important across. Absolutely. Okay. And I think quite it's like an elementary school teacher with, has teaching five different you know, courses of instruction to 20 to 30 kids, that's a lot. And then to try to have to deconstruct one learning, you know, intervention down, that's, that's just a, it's a lot of time and it's it a lot is. of work. And I'm it seeing at the, you know, at the high school level, okay, they have to master, you know, this, this, and this. But it, you would think that because they're a little more developed as a human being, it wouldn't but, take as much. But, you know, a I lot mean, of times... My take, I mean, I'm just... Yeah, it's outside. important across the board because we have, you know, a standards that have to be taught across the board. But a lot of times those standards at the elementary level are foundational. And those standards, we just continue to build on those standards as students matriculate through to we high school. They, they, we hope they will. Mm -hmm. you know. And the standards are written that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm sorry. Nope, you're perfectly... And so continuing with some challenges that we continue to uh, work with schools on, there are opportunities for, once again, students to respond to higher order questions that are aligned to more rigorous content standards. I think I've hit on that already. So part of the uh, Maryland accountability or is the Maryland Climate Survey. You have not gotten a report on that just yet? Uh, we just did a report on that, no, we but there's, be. there's a part to that that you are going to learn about. We just got the results back. Last year, students took that climate survey twice. They did it in November, and then they did it again, I believe, in April. The first time was sort of a pilot. The second time was the actual um, survey, and we did get the results of our survey back, and we do see some discrepancies there. Uh, when we look at the um, survey results for our student-to-student -student relationships, student-to-staff relationships, and some improvements that we probably need to make, that we definitely need to make with our physical environment. Um, we were able to get some guidance from the State Department with regard to a summary of what the each part of that survey was. They won't show us the survey. Uh, we don't know what the questions are on the survey, but we do know the main categories and we do know how our students responded um, in general. And I'm not going to steal Ms. Forbes' thunder because you are going to get a full presentation on that survey, but in general we saw lower scores in the areas that I identified across the board. The scores got lower as students matriculated through school. So in elementary school, they might have been, you know, a little low. In middle school, they got lower. And in high school, they got lower. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we've got some work to do there. Uh, there are still high numbers of students that uh, continue to need support with mental health and, and trauma. We are so grateful that we were able to hire uh, Megan Pender as our uh, mental health coordinator using Kerwin funds, and she is out there and she's working with our current staff, and uh, they, they have plenty to do, so we continue to work on that. Uh, we continue professional development for effective in implementation of culturally relevant teaching strategies, uh, social emotional learning, and working with our LGBTQ students um, to ensure that everybody feels welcome and have a sense of belonging in all of our schools. 
there's additional professional development that is needed to support our paraprofessionals. This year we had a, uh, a full out um, uh, really um, push for professional development for our support staff. We started over the summer, we continue throughout the year, and we have more planned. We've been working with some of our support staff to get their ideas on what needs to happen for uh, their professional growth. And some of them are very much interested in um, getting the rest of their education, whatever is needed, so that they can become certificated teachers. So that's a great thing. Um, we continue to look at uh, small group instruction because it is inconsistent across the district. Sometimes we see it practice uh, in every grade level in a school and sometimes it's, um, it, it's not as apparent. So we continue to work on that. And, and that's important because we need to make sure that we're addressing uh, the variety of student needs that we do have. So what are our next steps? What are we gonna do? We've got all this information. We have a lot of challenges, uh, or I should say we have a lot of strengths and we do have some challenges. And uh, we're gonna continue the second phase of our monitoring visits. So we, the first phase happens in the fall. The second phase is getting ready to start next week. We mentioned that just a little earlier. Um, I personally reviewed all of the uh, principal SLOs this year and uh, gave specific feedback, part of that meaningful feedback that I talked about earlier to each one of our principals. We continue to closely monitor student staff and administrator performance to ensure that when adjustments need to be made, that they are being made um, to their goals or the strategies that they're using to improve. We are increasing our expectations for student and perf um, staff performance at each of the schools as well as central office because that is important if we're gonna continue to grow um, our performance. We continue to collaborate with school leaders on analyzing their data from those monitoring visits that we do, and uh, we help them to create plans to improve in whatever area they need to show improvement in. Um, and it's all about improving that teaching and learning and getting uh, the most talented and um, well-developed teachers in front of all of our students. And uh, just to ensure that we always keep our students as our main focus, we certainly would want you to see some of their lovely smiling faces <laughs> in front of you. That's our, that's our main goal, to improve those instructional practices. And with that, if there are any other questions, yes, Captain Kelly. Under your climate survey, you were gonna be briefed on that. Now, is it gonna be specific enough so we can know how we can improve it? I'm looking at environment, physical environments of our schools. I was always impressed going in our, in our schools. Every time we came in, every school, I mean, they were in, they're old, a lot of them, but they're in great shape. So I'm not sure if it was physically how the school looks. Or so you won't see the questions, but we can give you a summary of what the questions in each category, con what, what they were about. Okay. So say, for example, because we asked the same thing. So for that physical environment, they asked questions about cleanliness, right? Are the bathrooms clean? They ask questions about if there are things that are broken in your school, do they get fixed right away? Those are the kinds of questions that they asked. And remember, there was the surveys were given to uh, fifth grade students on through high school, and they were given to our staff, right? And so these are the perspectives of our students and our staff. And interestingly enough, in my student advisory group in the beginning of the school year, when we started to talk about things that they wanted us to focus on, they said cleaning the bathrooms. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that. So as you walk through, you don't see that. Mm -hmm. But when you're a student and you're in that school every day, you know what's happening in that school. Thank you very much. One, one of the okay. things, you know, we have 14 schools and our principal, all our employees are very important. Principals seem to have one of the toughest jobs because they're managing a thing. Do we have good communications with, you know, with us, giving them the support and them telling us, telling us what we need? This is exactly one reason why we do these superintendent monitoring visits. So we can have face-to-face -face conversations about what schools need. As you, when, we'll make sure that you have access to that link for that page. But part of the information that we ask of principals is about what their needs are, whether it's staffing, whether it's equipment. We talk about the uh, materials of instruction. We talk about everything. Uh, we talk about employee attendance, uh, you know, and, and the reasoning behind 
behind that. So yes, we do outside of any regular opportunity. This is targeted time twice a year face to face with the central office leadership team to have all of those types of conversations. So I would say yes, we certainly do give multiple opportunities and we are engaged in those opportunities to have those uh, conversations. Yeah, opportunities, and, I, and it's like when the business I was in, it's sometimes when you approach somebody, uh, you know, they're being honest with you. You know, everybody wants to get along and do this. And when you come into something, you're superintendent. Mm -hmm. So they're going to treat you different than they're going to treat somebody else. Just to make sure we just have enough communication. And I don't say we don't, but I'm just asking that question because, you know, us as board members go in there and they see one of the your staff with us or you they're going to be a little different than they're going to be if we're just in there on a, on a basketball game a conversation is different from looking at the evidence mm -hmm. right so when we go we're looking at evidence we're looking at data we're looking at evidence and also i, I do want to say Mr. Pender, he gets the uh, work orders. He knows what needs to be done. He monitors that. There's not a lot of opportunity um, to hide things, I'm not thinking you know, hide, or, or to like not communicate things. So if if it's not if it's not being done, then we certainly want to address that. But that's not been our. Experience. I mean, just knowing the climate of it, have, you know, because we're a small system, make sure we have the feel of what's you know how it's working, and it's always going to be an issue somewhere. But exactly. Just, you know, but just do we have the feel and make sure that. You know, if there is a problem, tell us. And if there's not a, you know, vice versa. I mean, you because you can't solve something, you don't know it. Precisely. So this is an opportunity to do that. Perfect. And I just want to add to that, um, Dr. Kane, if I may. Uh, Mr. Smith, we, we meet with all of our administrators once a month for a whole day. Um, that gives us a, another opportunity, you know, to meet with them on a daily basis. We also survey our principals informally uh, every year. Um, to give us feedback. Uh, is there something more that you need professional development? Is there a skill? What do you think that's going to make a, a significant improvement? Um, and we use that information to target professional development uh, to be able to support them as well. And also at those ANS meetings month, that happen monthly, our administrators from central office come. And so there's an opportunity if you need to talk to Mr. Combs about some technology issues, if you need to talk about um, some transportation concerns, then we have Ms. Kay to come in. Of course, Mr. Pender is always here. Mr. Fister is here for finances. There are structures in place so that we give multiple, multiple opportunities. That's not... It, it, it hasn't been a concern for us because there are so many opportunities and people are pretty vocal. Uh, you know, if there's something that they I'm need, problem, yeah, 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 if there's something that they need, we'll they certainly it. do let us know. So, just, just, just so we all have a, you know, just a judge of the climate and, you know, because it just, it just helps because we're all in this, the, you're, you're going to get we're all heading in the same direction. Absolutely. And you're going to get some good information with regard to how our employees uh, perceive our school climates as well. We're doing a so, climate survey with the employees this year. That's the MSDE survey, that climate survey. Students get it and employees get it. So you'll, you'll get a briefing on both perspectives. Okay. Anyone else? Great. Thank you so much. Really Thank you. It. Mr. Fister, Blueprint for Maryland's Future. Do I need to take a motion? No. Okay. I got one hand I can do that with. Let's see how it is. I think. You didn't hear me, Mr. John. I'm sorry? I said, do I need to take a motion before we see this? <laughs> no. It's very brief. It's a oh, okay. nice little overview. Um, Thank you, President Harper, Dr. Kane, members of the board. Uh, for the record, John Fister, Chief Financial Officer. What I wanted to do tonight was just give you a brief, uh, sort of an update, certainly not an intensive overview. Uh, we're still in legislative session. You know, the bill is not yet dropped yet. Who knows when it's going to drop um, and exactly what all those criteria are. We're really not sure. So it is kind of a high level of where this started, where we are now, and what may be the potential impact for uh, Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Uh, so right now, I just want to give you, like I said, a brief little update, update you on what I know so far or what we know so far as far as the current and pending legislation and uh, what the impact's going to be on uh, Queen Anne's County. Um, as you know, it started as the Kerwin Commission. The first commission held its meeting, um, or the first commission meeting held its meeting, first meeting, sorry, September 29th of 2016. So this has been a long process. I mean, we're in 2020 already, so three and a half years of getting this thing up and running. 
Uh, the Commission gave an interim report in January of 2019. There's a link in your presentation if you'd like to uh, have something to sleep by. You can certainly read that report. Um, it is very in-depth, um, but there's a lot of good information in there as well. And 300 that, pages. That one doesn't work either. That, the that link doesn't? Link. Mm -mm. Okay, I'll, I'll it. update it. Yeah. Um, but then as the Kerwin finished, the Kerwin Commission finished its um, its work, it kind of morphed into what the last year's bill was called, Senate Bill 1030, the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. Um, they funded seven key objectives. Not all systems, not all school systems were eligible. Um, there were some criteria there, and we'll go over that in just a minute. However, there was the uh, laying the groundwork for consistent funding. I don't want to say equal funding. I want to say consistent funding between 20 and 21, and you'll see why I, I make that uh, note here later. And then um, there is some intensive additional reporting that's been put on uh, the school systems that, to the legislatures about how we're spending the money. Um, could we even get approved for the money, the application that we had to go through that. Um, so when we get this money, when it finally comes through to us, there's going to be so many strings attached to it and a lot of restrictions. Uh, we're not going to be able to do a lot of things that we maybe want to do. However, I think it's all geared to improving um, student performance. Uh, so for 20 and 21, the opportunities was the concentration of poverty school grant. Uh, we did not qualify for that because we don't have any schools that meet that threshold for the poverty. However, based on uh, what we've seen so far on their blueprint for what's going to happen over the next 10 years, those concentration of poverty numbers will decline. So I think it's 80, 75, 70. Once we get into the 60 or 65, we may have one or two schools that would be eligible for those fundings, but that's seven to however many years out. The pre-kindergarten supplemental grant for the first time, uh, the state recognized that we are providing uh, pre-K, some half day, some full day, uh, but those things were never funded. So there was some seed money there to kind of fund what you currently have in place uh, with full day. It does, still does not give us any dollars for half day, but does give us for full day. The teacher collaborative grant was more of like a competitive type grant. We did not uh, move forward with that one. The teacher salary incentive grant. Just, I Dr. There, King. The, yeah, there were a lot of restrictions to that, and it would have required us to pull people together in a short amount of time, and oh, it okay. just wasn't. Didn't have the resources. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I apologize. Thank no, you. No. no. Um, the teacher salary incentive grant, that was the $544,000 that went strictly to the teachers as a supplement to the match that uh, we put in the budget both last year and, um, or both this year and last year. Um, students with Disabilities Grant, uh, we did apply and we did get that. The Transitional Supplemental Instruction, or as we call TSI, for Struggling Learners, we did get that grant. And the Mental Health Services Coordinators, I think we spoke to earlier and we'll speak to again, uh, we did qualify for that. So what was the impact of this blueprint uh, on Queen Anne's County Public Schools? So for 20 and 21, we did get the full day pre-K, and as you notice in bright red, it says restrictions, and there are restrictions on what we can do with this money. Um, it was, again, like I mentioned, to provide funding for full day classes, um, and it did include our student count in a separate funding formula, so it was not morphed into or combined with the regular enrollment for formulas. They set it off to the side and said, this is what you have, this is what you get. What we were able to do with this funding in the current year was we bought some kindergarten, uh, pre-kindergarten teachers with that. We got $217,000 in FY20. We only get $196,000 um, next year. And that's why, coming back to my comment about consistent funding, not the same funding. The reason for that is we did have an increase in overall pre-K. However, we had more half-day kids and we lost a few full-day kids and the funding was only based on the full day kids. So that's the result of those in our September 30th enrollment numbers is what's showing the difference of the $20,710. So we are going to have to fund that ourselves? Yes, we will, because everything is going to be consistent as far oh, as the Because we have their people, we can't fire Yes, and, and we'll talk about that okay. here in just a second. That's a big thing with current, you know, it's, it's one thing getting this money, but then, you know, they make certain rules, you don't meet this criteria again, you know, it, 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 they can keep you know, it's a slippery slope, I'm afraid we could be going down. Yeah, and, and again, this we, keep in mind that this was, I use the term seed money. I mean, this just got the ball rolling. All of this is going to go away and be incorporated into the big legislation when it comes out that's going to have changes to funding formulas and all kind of criteria, you know, and, and an impact on local share, which we'll talk about in a minute. So 
it, it was something to get, like I said, the ball rolling, and we've got some funding. We're consistent on the money other than that $20,000, and, and i got a few more slides to talk about that. But it isn't something that's just going to be swept away. It, it goes away, but it, the, the result is going to be incorporated into the greater blueprint that we should all see some significant funding for. If it's equally done. Should be. For special education, funding was for to help um, further implement the IDE and uh, 504 plans. Um, and if we would not use all the money for that particular purpose, we had the ability to put money towards any other special ed initiative that was part of the Kerwin Commission. With this money, we funded uh, additional special education teachers in the current year. Um, again, we're getting the same funding for next year, but as you know, we give steps and colas. Generally, we would like to do that for our employees, but our funding's not going to uh, be impacted by this, so that money uh, will have to be funded locally as well. For the teacher salary incentive, again, uh, we had to give a 3% uh, salary increase uh, to be eligible for both the FY20 and the FY21. We have met that criteria. We applied to the state. Uh, they approved our plan, uh, but again, level funding. So there's no additional funding coming in in 21. It's the same funding that's coming in in 2021. The mental health coordinator, uh, again, funds just to hire a full-time mental health coordinator. Every LEA in the state got the same dollar amount. And it was just a flat $83,333. Um, we went out and we did hire a mental health service coordinator. It took until uh, November to get that position. Uh, one note that I had down here at the bottom was when the legislation first was enacted, we were only supposed to use that $83,000 for salary. MSD has come back and said the true intent of the legislation was we could use that for fixed charges. So that does help us out a little bit as far as funding that position. Um, so there's healthcare. not as much on the local. With health care and? With health care and, and FICA and, and uh, life insurance and those kind of benefits that the employees have. So are we, is that about where we ended up with all of those benefits and all at 83? Or are we short on that one too? I'd have to go back and add that to you, but I can I can get that number for you. I'm just trying to keep a running tally of what we need for the budget. Yeah, yeah. And with the steps in the increase, I'll right. I don't have her salary yeah. information with me. I mean, you'd have to be the salary had to be around sixty. Yeah. Well, again, there was no requirement on. We just had to have one, and then wherever it fit into our salary scale and Everybody structure, that's where it is. And you put benefits and other things. You're already here. But in other counties, they already had this position. Other counties, their position was worth a lot more. So you know, the local would then have to pick up the difference because it was just a flat 83, 333 that we received. But we were required to hire this position. As far as the TSI, um, it was to address the struggling learners in K-3 to with some one-on-one -on -one or some small group or some tutoring, as we call this, the tutoring grant. Uh, we purchased the universal screener. I think Dr. Kane and Mr. Peluski talked about that. That's that STAR 360. Um, and we will and have hired uh, some additional tutoring time. Again, same amount, 133,820 uh, for both years. That we can control, right? Those are, those we have a little bit of flexibility with that. Yes, as long as it addresses the K to three, and with our STAR 360, we put that in place to address K to eight. So we do have a little bit of flexibility, but as to what we do, it, as what we do with it, but its plan still has to be approved by MSDE to address K to three and the struggling learners and basically tutoring and one-on-one -on -one support instruction, but there's a little bit of flexibility. So did we actually hire a tutor? We increasing the rate of our temporary tutors. Okay. Not, not okay. dollar amount, the, the frequency, frequency and, the, yes. and the use of those tutors. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of flexibility, I was saying. It's yes, like yes. Now we could have done all tutoring and not hired, the, and not had the screener if we already had one in place, so that was the flexibility I was kind of alluding to. So the blueprint, after it was finished, formed a what they call the funding formula work group and issued recommendations, um, which is being debated now down in uh, Annapolis of, as far as the legislature. There is a link to the full work group recommendations. It's quite exhaustive. It's probably four to five pages, um, but I'll summarize a few of those things in these next couple of pages here uh, as far as the object of what the uh, blueprint was intended to do. So the, the proposal fully phases in the commission over the next 10 years, from 2021 through 2030, and will also while adjusting for inflation along those times. So a lot of the things that you're seeing preliminarily are best guessed estimates as to what impact would be for the county, government, for us through 2030. So they took a historical look of the last 15 years. What was the inflation rate 
over those 15 years and then just proactively put that same rate out to 2030. So by the time we get there, those numbers that you're seeing or will see through this legislation are going are, are gonna to vary. It's just a best guess um, actuarial adjustment at that time. Using their words, <laughs> under the proposal, every school system in the state will receive, and they use the word significantly more than they would have under current law. So we will receive more funding. Um, the use of the word significantly, obviously with the billions of dollars that's in this, we should certainly see significant funding, but we'll just have to see how the big counties play against the small counties and, um, and the politics let them play as they do. And what requirements you have to, I mean, you can fund you more, but they require more, you, they're, they're, you know, I mean, it's not like it's a windfall. Correct. And I'll use school psychologists. If there was money in here to fund school psychologists and the mandate that we have to have them, that's great, and they give us the money for it, but are we going to be able to find them? Um, here's the local government piece. They're expected to fund um, their local share um, beginning in 22. Um, and across the state, that's worth about $8.9 billion up through fiscal 30. So again, a lot of groundwork has to be played out. The politics have to come through. What's the local share? Where is each LEA in relation to their maintenance of effort and what their local share would be and whether they're above it or whether they're below it? So there's still a lot of variables until this legislation drops and we get a chance, not only myself, but the CFOs across the state, along with help with MSD and MAVE and everything like, like that, be able to analyze exactly what the impact's going to be. They did propose a slower phase in, and again, here's where the um, restrictions and the um, accountability are coming in, to allow the sufficient time for the state and local systems to develop necessary plans uh -huh. and systems uh -huh. recommended by the Commission to ensure the faithful implementation of those recommendations. Basically, accountability. We're going to give us the money, but they're going to make us account for it. They're going to restrict it, and we're going to have to report on it. And it, if we don't follow you know, their rules, we either will be in jeopardy of either not receiving it or losing it in the subsequent uh, fiscal years. Like I first last, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Is that that's an important piece for the public to know that there is accountability for all of this money because there's always a worry that it kind of goes away or goes places it shouldn't go. I don't have a problem with accountability. I mean, we no, need I, to be accountable. And honestly, I don't. I mean, I don't have a problem with accountability. What what concerns me is the is the um, frequency of accountability. I mean, we have annual audits. Uh, MSD, we just had a food service. We get audited all the time with all of the dollars, whether they come from the federal, the state, um, you know, the local, you know, as far as our annual audit. I'm just curious as to what this level of accountability is going to be because I can't imagine it being much more than what we are held accountable for now. Um, it's just going to be another layer on top of that. So we just have to be cautious as we move forward. Accountability is a great thing, but we don't need to count the same chicken five times. We are talking about the state. Yes, we are. <laughs> no. I mean, we are the legislative about auditors in there, the performance yeah. audit now, the, right. the, the inspector general, you know, we'll see where that goes. Right. Um, but it, That accountability is unique to Kerwin money, right? Is that what the plan well, is? Well, I'd, I'd say yes, and, and, and from what I understood, there's a performance audit issue there that's not related to Kerwin, and we already have that technically through the, with the legislative audits, and again, we have our annual audits. So our annual audit is going to show how we're spending the dollars, you know, whether we're staying in state categories and things like that. MSDE comes every two years to do an enrollment audit to make sure that we're counting our people properly. So we just just concerned about the the redundancy of the audits and well, the, the accountability. It's weird that they don't use the same data. You know, I mean, it's there. Why aren't they using the same data? Because they just don't share data very well. They we don't have a statewide reporting database, so we're constantly sending data back and forth just so one department in the same office has our data and it's interesting it is um, the escalator provision and we, we talk about education effort that will go away um, is what we know so far that was one of the recommendations so as you know we've talked about this if without the escalator or the education effort for the FY 21 budget we would have been funded a maintenance of effort of about fifty four thousand dollars because of the um, education effort, well, our maintenance of effort is now about $1.5 million. And just, just briefly, what that, what that represents is there's three numbers statewide that it compares. It compares the local wealth per pupil increase, and for this county, our local wealth per pupil went up 5.8%. 
the statewide average for per pupil went up 4.5 percent. But the education effort is only giving us 2.5. It's the lesser of those three numbers. So we're getting a mandated 2.5 from the county, but our local wealth per pupil in the county went up 5.8 percent. But that's what the education effort is. And then with the maintenance of effort law, had this not been in there, we would have received $1.5 million less. That goes away, but with the implications of the local share and some of the other formulas, hopefully that will offset that. Um, and again, there's a little bit of a change to the MOE pupil, you know, using a greater of and a three-year rolling average um, to work through that particular piece. So there is some lock, uh, I use the term lockbox, there are some restricted funds that the governor has set aside, and it, right now I don't have an idea as to whether they will be released. I assume so because it was in the FY20 budget to be released for this year, uh, for next year, I'm sorry. So FY21, there is a proposal for um, $83 per teacher in supplies. Um, we already pay $100 per teacher. We already reimburse teachers 100, so we'll have to see how that works out. And then incentive funds for 11th and 12th graders in the post-CCR or CTE pathway. So those are some of the things that could perhaps be in addition, about $500,000 that would come into us above some of the numbers that we have talked about in our budget sessions. And the reason we haven't discussed it, one, it's restricted, so if we do get it, it's going right here. And two, it's unknown at this point, but there is potential to get some additional funding for 21. Most of this that we're talking about blueprint will not take effect until 22. Oh, okay. Not 2021. Not 21, just these okay. two things here, but most of it will be for 22. Okay. Mm -hmm. See how it all pans out. Did anyone else yeah. have any questions, comments? So as, so as far as the 22, oh, I'm, yep, yeah. I'm not done. We got a couple more. As far as the 22 proposed initiatives, I think we, we, we touched on, on this previously. It was some mid-year increases uh, in the out years. Uh, we have to see what kind of match, if any, the, the state will, I mean, the uh, county will have to uh, put towards this. Funding increases for EL, um, as you know, that's a burgeoning population. Special ed, they've already addressed and will continue to address full day pre-K. Um, and career counselors at middle schools and high schools and re-examine funding efforts for nationally board certified. So there is a presentation uh, that the funding formula work group gave to the General Assembly in January and the link to that hopefully works. If not, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that they do, um, is here in this presentation. Um, I think it's about two hours long, so um, certainly peruse that um, at your leisure to get a little bit more idea of what's going on. Um, so what's next? Obviously, we've got some budgetary decisions for Queen Anne's County Public Schools and Maryland General Assembly. Um, I've heard this week the legislation will drop. I've heard by the end of the month the legislation will drop. Um, MSD has warned us, not warned us, has informed us that once this legislation drops, the CFOs need to take a hard look at all of the accountability measures that will be coming with this, um, I guess, to provide feedback um, to the legislature, perhaps testimony, and so on and so forth. Uh, we just have to wait and see, um, because it is still, you know, fluid. Um, as you know, there's going to be debate going on, um, and we have a very short timeline until session ends, unless they call a special session. Uh, so the Assembly's got a lot of work to do, and there's a lot of data that they've been gathering. I have a meeting at the end of this month with statewide CFOs, and we generally at this meeting will have somebody from the legislature. Hopefully it'll be after it drops, so we'll have some time to answer some questions there. Um, we also have uh, Mary Pat Fannin that represents Pazam. She's normally uh, part of that group. And then we have John Willems from MABE. So we do have a good contingent, um, and every year we've had this. We've, we see what legislation's coming, what the positions are, what the impacts are going to be, so therefore we can grab that information and, and come back to you with some, with some good information. But again, it's, it's really a wait and see until this legislation drops. Um, so currently, so the impact summary, so current near consistent funding, we are going to lose that $20,710, but uh, Captain Kelly, there will be no reduction in staffing because of that small um, uh, reduction in funding, even though we funded the positions with that. Um, so just wanted to rest assured we will not have any Kerwin um, related funding uh, changes. In proposed for 22, um, it's, it's still questionable. We have the ability to reallocate um, based on whatever the legislative intent is. The education effort, again, removed from the maintenance of effort. And I, I can't 
emphasize it enough, the stricter accountability and increased reporting that's going to come with all of these um, fundings. Just to clarify, we aren't we aren't losing a position for that twenty thousand. No, we're going to no. have to absorb the twenty. We will absorb it. Yes. So budget. there's no impact to, to staff. Really. Yes. Okay. Any Sorry, questions? As I get more information, we'll update through weekly updates as, as I can. Uh, if you've got any questions or you review the presentations. Do we um, have an estimated date of when they think they're going to put this through the legislature? So I, there was a bet that at the last meeting I was in, there was a bet between MSDE and, and one of the CFOs, and it was the bet was this week and I, uh, versus the end of the month. And I think the person, uh, the MSD who said it's the end of the month, is probably going to be having a nice lunch. Um, but it's it's anybody's guess. We MSD is thinking at least by the end of the month, but that again leaves a very short timeline uh, for debate and hearing, and it is a lot of work and it's a lot of money and and then what the repercussions are going to be from a tax standpoint and all that. On I have to see where it goes, and, and of course Governor Hogan's going to have some input on this as well. And it won't totally be resolved until right probably we're close to where the legislature ends in April. Yeah, I would think. So here we are trying to make decisions. Can be hard. Yeah, yeah. Well, fortunate we, with the exception, you know, this really impacts 22's budget. So most of our decisions, Kerwin's not going to impact other than those two other things. And if they come in at the last minute as restricted funds, we would just add those as if we got a new grant, and then we would you know, we would put that in place. So I don't see it really affecting our budget discussions, you know, for the FY21 budget. But maybe we need to start a little early on the 22 budget to start addressing these things. Well, the way I look at it, the 21 we're working on now, mm -hmm. and the whatever increases we want to do in 21 has to be continued in 22. So, it's, you know, it, it's going to be really hard. To, um, I mean, so this budget will be impacting the next budget just on our normal budget. Yes, process. yes, but the the Kerwin legislation really isn't impacting what we're doing okay. necessarily in this budget. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And my last communication was that the bill would be heard on the 17th. February? Uh, yeah. So, we should we're going to be there? I, I don't know. Or temporary. Anything else? Oh, no, we're there the 13th. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Thanks thank you. Much. Yep. Uh, would everyone like to take a break? Come back about 8.20. Is that good? Thank you. And we are back from our break. Thank you so much. On our agenda, a human resources report. As presented in closed session, do I have a motion to accept it? So moved. A second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions and comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the HR report as presented in closed session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you very much, Ms. Bass. Mr. Bester, I appreciate it. Uh, we are now on policy for approval. Mr. Paluski. Yes, Madam President. Um, superintendent would like to uh, seek approval. Action item 8.02. Uh, would be approve uh, the Code of Ethics and Conflict of Interest uh, policy, excuse me, 104, 104.1. Uh, to date, we have not received any feedback from the public uh, based upon the, um, based upon it now going into the final read. So it is prepared for uh, approval. I have a, um, I have two items, legal items from our, um, legal team just uh, some small changes uh, definitions under C to add the words limited liability company a corporation general company and then also add um, comma limited liability company we just need to list all those business entities um, I also in our purpose just uh, for clarification and again, this is just legalese, a technical, which we can resubmit it to state it's not, it won't hold us up. Okay. Do anyone else have any other questions, comments, revisions? I do. Um, Mr. Puliski, the on the yellow sheet, the first sheet, <clears throat> did, did we get, we have no checks on there. Did we, any of the stakeholders see this? 
Because you, we have a list it's, of stakeholders and nothing is signed as far as on there. Have they been seen it? So it has been distributed to them, uh, but we have not received any feedback from them. Okay. Uh, nor have we received any feedback on the on our website no for worries. the public as well. It's a okay. good question. Thank you, Captain Kelly. Sure. And um, there's another thing. Uh, first, I want to apologize for not looking more closely at this earlier than the final read. Um, but I, I really went through it with a fine tooth comb this week, and um, there's only only a small change I wanted to make um, because I have observed what I consider to be significant conflicts of interest surrounding ethics violations on the board over the years I've, I've been on the board. So before I can vote to approve it, there's just one thing I would like to change is on the definition for immediate family. That's right in the beginning. Um, and immediate family, we have a spouse and or dependent children. I wanted to add in there a spouse, a parent, guardian, or s dependent children or siblings. I think we should have put that kind of immediate family, a parent, siblings of the uh, individual, and a guardian, if there's a guardian. Is that in the statement, Captain Kelly? It's Where's definitions? Oh, three definitions. N. No, it's in our this current policy. It's in policy. Page three under definitions, immediate family. Under immediate family. I would and like to expand that immediate family. Thank you. If there's any, anybody has an objection no, to that. No, that makes good sense. Okay. And so then the follow-on is under the regulation that was created. Well, that um, would follow with it. If we change that in the policy, it automatically goes to the regulation. Right. Well, da right. Well, down in the regulation, we talk about qualified relative. And I guess that's where we should have immediate family. There's like three sections in there that talks about qualified relative. And that's what I think is immediate family. So Can you give us the page, Captain Kelly? Um, that's under A1B business about businesses dot uh, I, 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 and four. So A1A? A, under the regulation elements, it's A1B. A1B. Oh, I, I? Yeah, I, I. Okay. I, 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 and I, there's <coughs> okay. three of them. Okay. So everywhere it says qualified relative, gotcha. I'd like to change that to immediate family with that new definition. Which, what, what page is that? Uh, it's, um, right at the page, one page one of, of the regulation, um, and it's A, participation, 1, B, I, 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 4, and I, um, I. It, it also is I, I. So that is pertaining to the definition um, when we talk about the immediate family, so qualified rel relative is referencing that, so we'll make sure that they align. Yeah, so just wherever a qualified family comes in, that word should be immediate family, or immediate yeah, immediate family. As per the definition in the policy of Correct. immediate family. Correct, per the policy's definition, that's all. We can make, I mean, the regulation, yeah, that's fine. The immediate family right now that we have in here, as I recall, Mr. Polisky, this is the definition the state has. That's correct. That's why we left it as spouse and yes. family. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I, 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 like I know the county has more to what Captain Kelly's saying than what that is. We need, based my experience, we need to expand that. Mm -hmm. I don't see a problem with that. I mean, I should see a problem with that. It's just it's actually, it's just a legal edit, so I don't think that's it won't hold us up, will it, Mr. Polisky? I don't believe so. That might be a, a that might be a Mr. Mr. Burns, Burns if, question. By adding just adding the verbiage, it, will we have to put that back out for? Because I, honestly, I don't want to spend any more time. We have done months on this. Darren Burns, uh, Board Council, for the record. Um, Madam President, uh, Dr. Kane, uh, I think you, you have put this before the public on, on more than one occasion. You've put it out and notified the public that it's this is the final time you're going to look at it and that you plan to adopt it. I think if you have a properly framed motion to make the kind of amendment to the proposed final adoption version and it's approved by the sufficient number of the board, then you could in turn move to adopt that amended policy. I mean, you are doing this out in public. You're doing this, you know, pursuant to the Open Meetings Act. You've notified the public this was going to be heard today. Uh, many boards on their final reading, or whatever you want to call it, will make final amendments to what they're going to adopt. I would agree that, I think you mentioned technical and, edit and, and legal yeah. earlier. 
the other technical changes I don't think would require a separate motion, but I, be, I do believe changing a definition like this in light of the board's comments would be substantive and require a separate motion. So to ask Prior for to adoption. It, prior to adoption. So ask for a motion to accept it subject to any final amended technical or legal edits. When you get to that point, but if, if in fact there's interest on a board member's part at this stage to amend the version you will eventually vote on in that way, that board member would have to make a separate substantive motion to, to amend the policy. To include this verbiage. Amend the fine. Okay. So we need a motion and you need to okay. spe be specific about what you want put in here. So I move. Uh, wait, I, I make a, a motion for to amend the final version of the ethics policy on to um, better to more thoroughly define immediate family to read a spouse, a parent, guardian, siblings, and or dependent children as the new definition for immediate family. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions and comments on the motion? Would you like to speak to it? No, I, th I just think that's important to expand it. Um, in particular, for a small community like this, there's, well, I, ba I basically think we should expand that because it's important for uh, ethics in a small community. Anyone else? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to expand the definition in the Code of Ethics Conflict of Interest Policy, the definition of immediate family to read a spouse, a parent, a guardian, siblings, and or dependent children. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you. One more technical thing, Mr. Paluski, and I think we corrected in the policy meeting today, was... Uh, definitions J, ethics panel, subsection S was changed from A. We did that today. I just want to make a note of it before we go forward. Uh, ethics panel, the Board of Education's Queen Anne County Public Ethics Panel established under section 4, subsection S of this policy, not A. It's just technical. Yes. It, by the time we can moved and shook everything up. I, I have to um, uh, give a, a congratulations and, and a sincere thank you to everyone who played part in this ethics policy. Uh, we have, it's been countless hours and meetings and I, and I truly appreciate all the time and effort that everyone has put into this. So without further ado, may I have a motion to approve the adoption of policy 014, Code of Ethics and Conflict of Interest, subject to any final amended technical or legal edits. I have so 104. 104, Pol code, policy 104, Code of Ethics, Conflict of Interest, subject to any final technical or legal edits. For motion? So moved? Second. And amendments, you said amendments. I said, yes. And that includes amendment yes. that was- Yes, just done. Just yes. Okay, Second. so moved. Motion is second. Sorry. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the motion to approve the adoption of policy 104, Code of Ethics and Conflict of Interest, subject to any final amended and technical or legal edits. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Motion is carried. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, everyone here. When Thank I was you, there on the County Ethics Commission, we would have somebody come in and explain some of the things with ethics and how perception and stuff. Do we do that in this? <laughs> so once we have our policy uh -huh. um, approved, now that we do, we will do professional development on this policy. Because some, and you will be included in okay. that. Mm -hmm. This has been a year and a half of work. Because I've been involved with a couple of people that have come in and, and we'll do it pro because, and it gives, I, it gives some insight because sometimes people look at something, absolutely not thinking they're doing a thing wrong, but it's either perception or something where they just don't yeah. see it. And when they, but when somebody explains it, then you can say, well, yeah, I could, you know, I could, mm -hmm. you know, I think it, you know, our supervisors, maybe the executive team, or maybe a couple board members could do that. So then, oh, we'll have our um, legal counsel do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing is that if we could do it before the financial disclosure forms are due, which is the end of April, it would be useful. So we. Well, that has it, an explanation there about how we do it. Absolutely, and so part of the. Um, you know, the significance of this policy is that we hadn't been able to move forward with any detailed professional development 
um, and now we will. And so we'll be just in time for uh, April, and I think it will be, it'll work and well. It was interesting one time we had, I think it was a member of the electrical board, and he put down that he received a $50 gift. Well, it was from his God's father, gave him a gift for Christmas, but he didn't understand. I mean, but it was over the $25 thing. And I think some of the stuff, it, it, they're just, you know. Common misunderstanding, con con and it yeah. Just, I think it's, it helps everybody concerned that, um, you know, it, it, it can be looked at that way. And, mm -hmm. you know. and we need to, you know, re-engage our ethics uh, panel too. Absolutely. Yeah. We've done that in yeah. We need to put, hold. if we could please put that back out. Absolutely. Because uh, those folks have been on there for seven yeah. to ten and, years. And bless them all. They, oh, yeah. they worked with us, you know, yeah. last year as uh, we tried to get this, you know, moving forward and knowing that, you know, it was, it was, it was, yeah, it was, they gave up some time as a sacrifice. So, yep, we're happy. Now we can move forward. So we're happy so, to do that. That's good. Someone could put that back out of mm -hmm. maybe the website and put out the blurb out to all the papers we need to ask for um, some volunteers for the ethics panel. You know, and that, I always read in the Bay Times that they're advertising for members of um, boards and things, the county. Yeah. I think we ought to latch on to that that breed. So they say a board member, like we should have for a board member, or ethics panel for the board of education, you know, because we should go under where the county is, is people all look at that and they pick out jobs that way. I, instead of having it come always separate. That's just the thought. And you're asking people to volunteer their time. Right. Because it is an unpaid position. Yeah. All right, thank you all. We, uh, at the current time, field trip, trip number 1800, Queen Anne's County High School, AP Environment class to the Karen Noonan Center, April 2nd through April 4th of 2020. This is an overnight trip. It is, uh, Madam Richardson President. County. Uh, it is for the uh, AP uh, at Queen's County. Tell them to County. take their bug spray. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is in South uh, Dorchester. Um, it's a it's a phenomenal outdoor center. If, if you Googled it, it's it's used uh, quite frequently from a lot of schools on the Eastern Shore. Um, so, uh, Superintendent's recommending this field trip uh, overnight. So I see that students will be paying the fees if there's a grant they can. Help Correct, and support from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Okay, that's fabulous. That's fantastic. Any, anyone, any questions? Do I have a motion to approve the trip number 1800, Queen Anne's County High School AP Environmental Class to the Karen Noonan Center April 2nd through April 4th, 2020? Do I have a second? Okay. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to approve trip number 1800 for Queen Anne's County High School. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you all very much. We are at expenditure reports, <coughs> sir. Thank you, President time. Harper, Dr. Kane, and board members. Before you tonight is the monthly expenditure report, both in summary and detail format. Uh, it's for information only. No action is necessary. All categories are in a positive state, uh, at least for now. Uh, we still have a concern about special education and transportation, which we're monitoring closely. Uh, we did inform the county about a potential deficit in special education as required by law. However, comparing uh, to last year, our spending overall was within 1% overall. Uh, so I'm confident that uh, uh, you know we're right on target as to where we were last year. Again, we still have the two concerns. But uh, with that said, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And the only thing I see is, and of course, we know special ed, but I see transportation at 99.5. Yes. I guess we've paid a lot of our bills already up front to make sure we go to June the 30th. Well, because of the, uh, as we've talked almost ad nauseum about with the special ed transportation going to the other side, we're incurring additional overtime. So that will most likely um, require a categorical transfer. But that's where you're seeing the most of the cost is in the overtime and transportation costs related to the non-public transportation because we're transporting two I believe it's two students more this year than last year without an increase to that budget. And everything else, all the other things are in, in line. In line, yes, sir. So I guess I don't understand what you said on, you talked to the county commissioners and now you're saying we won't, won't need extra money? No, no, no we no. informed them, but if we know we're potentially, as you, when I was not here in December, 
the, the categorical for special ed was negative. We had two um, changes that we needed to make. One was we had an additional funding source from the um, Medicaid, which helped out. And then uh, after researching, we had a purchase order that was charged to the wrong account. So when we reversed both of those, that put us back into a positive nature. But because we were in a negative state in December, we had to inform the county that we have a potential deficit, and that's what I was referencing here, that we did inform the county that we might have a potential deficit. Um, once we get a little bit further into this month and the next payroll hits, probably we'll be sending that same letter regarding transportation. And then when we actually do need to do that categorical transfer, that'll be the formal process that you're all used to. Okay. I, I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't Thank you. Yes. Uh, transfer notice, sir? So transfer notice. Um, so this is, again, strictly for your um, information only. No action is needed. Uh, based on the contracts approved by this board um, that we did earlier in the year, we needed to move funds from salaries because of the vacant positions, both in the communication specialist and the interim director of HR, over to the contracted lines uh, that funded both of those positions, uh, communications for the whole year, interim director for half a year. So what you're seeing, again, is one of, is required by 5105 that we inform uh, the county commissioners that we've made an internal transfer, inform the board as well. Within administration, didn't require anything. It was just a simple salaries to contracted services, as I indicated here. The other little caveat is from um, office supplies because of when we did the, um, the security in this building, and the increased cost of the badges for all the visitors that are coming out here that we never had to do that. We needed to move some money to distributed services to pay for some of those um, uh, badge supplies and the machines. This does not require a vote from us? No, ma'am, it does not, because it's within administration. So it doesn't okay. even require approval right. from the county? The, the ones that we will be... Just letting them know. Yep, yes. And the ones that we will be doing for transportation, especially, we will probably have to, we will have to take those funds from another category. And have approval That will require us. your approval and commissioner approval before we can institute that. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Everybody good? Another right. set for public comment. Thank you. Like to come up and thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Public comment. Okay. Um, future school board meetings. February 12th is a work session. February 19th is a work session. We will be discussing budget. Um, I, hopefully by the 19th, maybe we'll have some more Kerwin idea. Eh. Maybe March. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, we on the March 5th meeting, we will be having the proposed Correct. superintendent. Mm -hmm. I think it's March 4th. Is it March 4th? I believe it is. March 4th. And then if you heard in the rest of our meeting, we have a lot of things going on in February. I just want to make sure that I have all this in here. February 12th, 19th, 13th is Mabe. The 19th is the African American Heritage. Um, that's Friday. Okay. Oh, the 14th? Um, actually, I have it for this Friday. Uh, Sudlersville, African American um, Heritage, okay. 6 to 8, Sudlersville Middle, February 7th. Okay. The 19th is our work session. 19th is a work session, yes. And That's the high school open houses. I know. I saw that. I was like, mm. do you need to be there? At the open? Okay. Anyone else have anything else to bring in? Bring up? We're all good? We're still awake? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, do I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote of the motion to uh, oh, close, uh, close our open session. It shows how tired I am. Close our open session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you all very much. Have a pleasant evening. <laughs>